Yeah, best song ever. Uh, have I ever talked to someone incredible about the Phoenix Lights? Any theories? You mean the Christmas lights every every Christmas, December? Oh, they're beautiful. Yeah, many Christmas lights in Phoenix. But I think you're talking about UFOs, right? There are no UFOs. I mean, if there are, if there's intelligent life out there, they don't care about us. They would have stopped uh, even trying. I mean, what's the point? It takes too long to communicate. Uh, this is uh, a great debate between uh, Chris, Chris Fisher and Matt Slick. You know, I remember years ago talking to Chris Fisher on comment section of some video, and he, I. I don't remember exactly what was said, but I remember that he didn't like me. But then I said something, and he completely changed. It's like, oh, and then it stopped. So I'm not sure if Chris Fish Fisher likes me or not. Um, I have nothing against Chris Fisher, and I have nothing against Matt Slick. I actually like both these guys. Uh, I disagree with both of them. And so I think I can act as a good impartial referee between open theism and... Um, they call it open theism in the Bible, but it's really open theism versus Matt Slick's version of uh, of Christianity, and he's a Calvinist. And I've on, I've been on record saying I um, I like Calvinism. I think it's one of the most consistent forms of Christianity because basically whatever God says goes. Deal with it. Calvinists really understand what grace means. They understand that uh, there's nothing you can do to inherit the kingdom of heaven, lest ye boast from your works. There's no syllogistic uh, synergism there. So I, I appreciate that about the Calvinists. They can give very simple answers because uh, they basically just put everything in the hands of God. But I also like open theists. I did an a, a interview with a guy named Will Duffy, who's an open theist, many years ago now. I liked Will Duffy. He seemed like a very nice guy. I think open theism combined with universalism is the uh, best way to deal with the problem of evil if you're a Christian. You know, it's funny because when I was a Christian, like if I was to go home to my parents tomorrow and say, hey, what do you think about open theism? They go, what? What's open theism? Most Protestants and Catholics, I'm guessing, have no idea what open theism is. But uh, let me um, summarize what open theism is, and Chris Fisher will define it too, although he confused me on a few things. Um, open theism is basically God is like Thor, except way, way, way better. Thor can't see the future because the future doesn't exist yet. Thor is a person with feelings and emotions, learns things, Sometimes get th gets things wrong. Yahweh, God, is just like Thor, except way, way better. Way more powerful, way nicer. Like Thor needs this hammer. God doesn't need a hammer. That's open theism in a nutshell. So as you can tell, uh, and of course open theists will think I just straw man them, but give me some grace. You know, I'm just a poor atheist who doesn't know anything. Um, but as you can tell that the problem of evil just shrivels up when you're an open theist because... God created the universe, put people into it, and then they betrayed him. And he goes like, whoa, never saw that coming. I mean, I give them all this and they do that to me? And then he has to wipe them out in the flood. Whoa, they're so evil. I, I got to do this. I mean, I regret that I made them in the first place. It says that in the Bible, by the way. I got to see what these people are doing down here. So God comes down from the heavens. By the way, open theists, I think, agree with, and Matt Slick, this is part of the reason why he doesn't like open theism, is my bet. Um, open theists are more aligned with the critical uh, exegesis and analysis from secular humanists on the Old Testament. They're more in line, like, if you go and listen to a, a secular, you know, evil person who teaches the Old Testament, they will say, yeah, the view of God in the Old Testament is more like Super Thor or Odin. Some, some of them even think Yahweh had a penis. 
I don't go that far. <laughs> but I remember as a kid, kid meaning maybe a teenager, uh, going up to my pastor when I was a Christian and asking, well, wait a minute. There's certain things God can't do, right? Like make a stone so big that he can't lift it. Yeah, yeah, because it's a logical contradiction. and he, God can't do logical contradictions. Okay, so I said to my pastor, if it's true that God can't do certain things because it's impossible or against his nature, could it be true that God can't know certain things because they're unknowable? If God can't do things because they're not doable, can, is it possible God cannot know things because they're not knowable? Now, I was a kid and I asked that question not knowing what open theism was. Only decades later, seriously, I didn't learn about open theism as a formal type of thing uh, until maybe a decade ago. Uh, they basically are asking the same questions I did as a kid. Maybe God doesn't know the future because are our choices already made? How can God know our future choice if we don't even exist yet? And this is the problem with uh, predestination and this type of foreknowledge. If you believe, like Matt Slick does, that every thought, every choice you make has been known by God before he even created you, that means that in a sense, you are co-eternal with God. In a sense. That your choices, your, everything you think and believe and do has existed eternal past in the mind of God. Kind of funky if you think about it, right? Anyhow, without further ado, let's uh, listen to this. And I know people get mad when I stop it. So I'm going to actually just let these guys do the work. And for the stupid people in the live stream chat where I feel you need uh, help, I'll explain things to you in my simple way. You go first. All right. Cool. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, Chris, you're up first, man. Um, and I'll start your time as soon as you've been to speak. And also remember that. That little ding that let you know you got one minute left in your presentation, man. So start wrapping it up. All right. Oh, well, let me let me say this though. Uh, this was done on. Uh, oh man, sorry. What's the uh, what's the name of the channel that hosted this? The black guy. What's the name of this channel? Uh, I forget. Oh, I'm so sorry. I should know this. But anyhow, he took it down. So I'm playing it off of uh, God is open, which is Chris Fisher's. This guy's. Uh, and for the for the life of me, I don't understand why they took it down. I. Like, it gets contentious, it gets a little heated, but no big deal in my opinion. But anyhow, people can do what they want with their channels. The volume is low? Okay. Let me uh, bump it up. That's it. I'll start the time you begin to speak. Tonight I'm here to talk about open theism. If you pull up open theism on Wikipedia, it's defined as a rejection of the synthesis of Greek philosophy and Christian theology. Marlin, this is a good definition. You, Wilson. Open theism really is the rejection of Platonism. Open any systematic theology. They will start with Platonism. God is ineffable, simple, timeless, pure act, immutable, impassable. Even attributes like omni omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence take on negative meanings. God is not omnipresent. God is nowhere. God is not omnipotent. God lacks agency and volition. God is not omniscient, but his knowledge is simple, ungenerated, non-discursive, unfalsifiable, and identical to himself. This is not the God of the Bible. The biblical audience did not even have this as a theological option. In the Bible, God is a person. He's not a formula. He does not operate mechanistically. He is a person with thoughts, desires, goals, even conflicting priorities. God faces trade-offs and uses a host of tools to accomplish his goals. Let's look at the enduring promise to Abraham. Now, this is the most important promise in the Bible. When the Bible says God does not change, it's in regard to this promise. When it says he does not lie, it's about this promise. Several times in Israel's life, God threatens to kill all Israel and fulfill his promise through a contingency plan. The Pharisees thought they were smarter than God. They thought that God was trapped by his promise. John the Baptist tells them, God can innovate in ways you don't conceive. He can fulfill his promise by raising new children from the stones. Watch Slick carefully tonight. He'll push for God formulas. He wants metaphysical code that explains God. If X, then Y. This is entirely a Platonistic mindset. And you'll notice in his debates that he... By the way, I agree with everything Chris Fisher has said so far. He's talked for close to two minutes. Um, to me, it's just very reasonable to think that the New Testament was influenced by the Greeks. More so than the Old Testament. Maybe towards the last part of the Old Testament writings, you could see Greek influence. But... 
when Chris Fisher says Platonism, you know, that can be defined. There's so many things involved with that. Basically, he's saying God is not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere, knows everything. Um, these are ideas that came from Greek thought. I agree with them. He will philosophize in almost exclusively Platonistic categories. He quotes Plato's changing perfection formula in his Will Duffy debate. Keep in mind, the Bible never talks about God like this. One thing Matt Slick also does, did in that, that debate was proof text trumping. All right, so story time. I was at this debate, and I talked to Matt Slick after the debate, the Will Duffy debate. We're talking about Exodus 32 or some such text, and Matt Slick retorted, God is omniscient and knows all past, present, and future. 1 John 3.20, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. I said, yeah, and man does too. 1 John 2.20, just one chapter earlier, but you have an anointing up from the Holy One and you know all things. Matt's yeah, this is great by Chris to bring this up, but it gets to, this is what the text says, but this is not what the text means. So uh, a guy like Chris Fisher, who's an open theist will say, yeah, it says in the New Testament that God knows everything, but it also says the same thing about men knowing everything. So you really can't t take it to mean that God literally knows everything, even things that don't exist yet, like our future choices. But a guy like Matt Slick, uh, Slick will say the same thing about the Old Testament. Yeah, it says that God repented that he made humans uh, during the flood. Yeah, it says God came down to Sodom and Gomorrah to see what was going on. But it doesn't really mean that. Yeah, it says God walked in the garden. He said, Adam, where are you? It doesn't really mean that God didn't know where Adam was. So they both, Chris and Matt Slick, will both say, yeah, this is what the text says, but that's not what it means. So it all boils down to interpretation. Slick, his eyes went wild as he read my verse. His laptop was on stage. So he jumps up from our location. He runs to the stage and he starts typing furiously. He's like, it's not in this version. It's not in this one. I said, yeah, it's in the Byzantine text. He kept typing, it's not in this one, it's not in this one. Thought, oh no, this guy's looking at English versions. Uh, this man doesn't know what the Byzantine text is. Okay, so the next day, Matt's like tells the crowd. Yeah, yeah, English versions. Everybody knows that the Bible was written originally in German. That's the what I was taught when I was a kid. God spoke uh, Plotich. He could give them a personal Bible study on 1 John 2, 20. Yeah, it's in the video, it, it's on video. It's something he had Googled the previous night. So here's the point. One, if Matt Slick offers to teach you anything, that means he Googled it last night. Two, it's not as if the majority of Greek-speaking Christians throughout history thought that mankind was omniscient. The phrase that Matt Slick wanted to mean his very idiosyncratic theology is just not magically imbued with what he claims. You'll find that almost all of Matt Slick's proof texts are half verses without contextual analysis where the same phrases are used about man elsewhere in the Bible. God's yep. understanding is infinite. So is the amount of grain that Joseph collected. God inhabits eternity. Mankind inhabits eternity. God is perfect. Job, Noah, and normal people are perfect. Excellent point, what uh, Chris just said. Because the Bible does say, well, it depends on what version you read, but it um, does allude to the fact that Noah was perfect. He was righteous. So, well, it's, of course, Noah wasn't perfect. He was just very, very good. Well, maybe God's not perfect in every way. See, but these are things that the more traditional uh, Christian cannot handle. No, no, can't go there. Believers know all things. They understand all things. They're filled with all knowledge. They know all things perfectly from the beginning. King David knows all the things on the earth. The writer of Ecclesiastes has seen all the works under the sun. No secret can be hidden from the Prince of Tyre. Paul was even foreknown by the Jews from the beginning. This is just normal language applied to normal human beings. Whenever Matt Slick gives a proof text, watch to see if he does any contextual analysis to show that his proof text means anything close to what he claims. Slick and Calvinists do this thing where they think that just explain. I got to make one recommendation to Chris Fisher here. Buy bigger shirts. You're a big guy. You need bigger shirts. And uh, if you're washing them, make sure it's in cold water and don't put those cotton shirts in the dryer. Explaining what they think a verse means is the same thing as proving the verse means that thing. We will call this the begging the question fallacy. A verse in the middle of Malachi, ripped from its own context, is used to claim a verse in Genesis doesn't mean what it says, never mind that the Malachi verse has nothing to do with the Genesis verse, never mind that the Malachi verse is split in half, Malachi, and the context is about Malachi. God writing an entirely new book to show the righteous he will not accidentally punish them on his return. 
somehow this verse means a complex narrative in which God's own regrets play a pivotal role. Somehow that doesn't mean what it says. Another problem with Calvinists like Matt Slick is that they rely heavily on the non-central fallacy. If you Google worst argument in the world, this tops the list. This is one uses maybe technically correct, but misleading wording to make a point. It's a rhetorical sleight of hand rather than a real argument. Let me give you an example. I was debating a Calvinist who was trying to use the non-central fallacy, so I flipped the script. I asked him if God was the reigning king of everything. Oh, of course, he says. I asked him if that includes homosexuality. Oh, yes, of course. I tell him, yeah, yeah, in your view, God's the reigning king of, yeah, what's a name for like a bundle of sticks? Yeah, this Calvinist was not happy to have his own rhetorical tricks used against him. In Calvinism... Although I thought Satan is the reigning king of the earth right now. God rapes babies. It is, in fact, a technically correct statement. God is the primary agent in everything that happens. The problem is, that's not how people use language. It gives a false impression. It's the non-central fallacy. Slick starts his Duffy debate calling God ignorant for situations which no normal person would call God ignorant. It, yeah, he has a tendency to follow up anyone's statement with his own labels, which are clearly idiosyncratic, calling things man-centered. Poisoning the well is also a familiar tactic of Matt Slick. Watch the Duffy debate, in which Slick brings up Mormonism maybe a dozen times, although Duffy never mentioned it once. Matt Slick kept trying to get Duffy to affirm quotes from the Book of Mormon without telling him where it was from. At the end of the debate, I stood up. I asked him if he agreed with the quote on predestination. It's all on camera. Slick said he did. I revealed it was from Plotinus, the most influential Neoplatonist philosopher from, from whom Augustine drew heavily. Matt Slick instantly started talking about the genetic fallacy. When I pointed out that he, was, he did the same thing to Will, he lied and said he didn't. Poisoning the well fallacy. This happens every time Matt Slick calls something pagan when those are the things that normal biblical or scholarship say about the Bible. Yeah, that would be the opposite of pagan. The truth is, Slick is a Platonist. His talking points about perfection come straight from Plato's Republic, laundered through Platonist church fathers from Hellenized North Africa. Augustine, who was a major Platonist influence in the church, freely admitted that the Bible was absurd until he read it in light of Platonism. Augustine had better reading skills than most Christian YouTube personalities. Augustine stated that all his theology could, could be gained directly from the Platonists, except for one thing, that was Christ. And what's Christ to Augustine? The divine enlightening spark that allows Platonic ascent. One sees this Gnostic enlightening in modern Calvinist discussions on, oh, the unregenerate can't read the Bible. I often get this response when I ask Calvinists how a random person at the mall might understand a particular text. Calvinists intuitively know their claims are unsustainable by normal reading comprehension. When he starts philosophizing, start thinking, where is this thought process? Chris is right here. Gotta say it. Because I've talked to Calvinists, and um, they will say to me, and I, again, they'll view this as a straw man, but that's okay. Uh, I'm an atheist, so you just gotta assume everything I say is a straw man of their position. Because I'm not regenerate. Um, the fact that I have not been regenerized by the Holy Spirit means I cannot truly understand the scriptures. It's the Holy Spirit that guides to all truth. I don't have the Holy Spirit, so therefore I cannot be guided to all truth. Unless G God makes an exception here and there. Whereas Chris is coming from, hey, anybody can understand the scriptures if they do it properly. You don't need this special spark, this uh, X factor called the Holy Spirit. I think that's what Chris would say. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Bible. The Bible tells us all about God, including how God knows what he knows. It's not Platonic omniscience. God knows because he sees. Hebrews 4.13. God knows because he does. Isaiah 46.10. God knows because he predicts. Psalms 139.1. God knows because... Yeah, okay. Sorry for stopping it here, but God knows because he predicts. There's a fine line with being, let's say, a very, very good predictor and a knower. Like if God can predict with 99.99999% accuracy what's going to happen in the future, is that really any different than being omniscient about the future? I say no. And this is, although open theism is great for the problem of evil, I think this is its weakness. And I remember bringing this up with Will Duffy uh, about the problem of evil and other things. I forget what he said, but I think he, I stumped him on that. Like, what's the difference about being a perfect predictor and um, being omniscient about something that doesn't exist yet? Yes, Deuteronomy A2. The entire Bible is open theism. Open to a random page. Look for references to God. Does it talk about his actions and his changes? Does it talk about him being living and dynamic? Does it talk about his emotions? Does it talk about his thought process? Does he interact with people? Does God watch the world? Does he respond to changing events? Does God answer prayer? 
in the Bible. God is the, not the Platonic concept of a simple, timeless, ineffable, impassable being of pure actuality. God is the living God. If God is living, open theism is true. So tonight, if you're watching at home, I propose a drinking game. Every time Slick offers to teach something offline, drink. Every time Matt Slick uses a demeaning descriptor, poisoning the well, drink. If he's fishing for sound bites, the non-central fallacy, drink. Matt Slick conflating, explaining his reading with proving that his reading is true, the begging the question fallacy, drink. Let's add some more because I want you all to die of alcohol poisoning. The fallacy of composition. If God knows one thing about the future, God knows everything eternally, drink. Equivocation fallacy, explaining God's knowledge as analogous to ours when it suits his argument, but denying it when it doesn't. Bottoms up. And one more moralistic fallacy. If it makes Slick sad, then it's not true. We'll call this neuroticism. Drink. Watch for these fallacies. Type drink in the comments when you catch them. Happy. Although Chris is framing this in a very condescending way, uh, he's not wrong. Like Matt does do this a lot, especially the one about you don't understand X. Uh, if you want, we can go offline and I can explain it to you. I think Matt's actually said something like that to me. Um, and you'll hear it coming up. Happy drinking. It's over to you. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Chris, for your open statement. All right. So Matt. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Big stretch. I'll relate things uh, to God properly with humility, I hope, as I try and serve him. Uh, the debate is not about God and open. The, excuse me, the debate is about God and open theism, not my Calvinism, uh, uh, in which uh, I'm, I'm very, very knowledgeable in it. He did not represent it very properly, very well. It's unfortunate. If he wants to debate Calvinism with me sometime biblically, I'd be glad to do that. But there, well, okay. But, um, <clears throat> so uh, notice what he did. He, he accused me of being a liar, neurotic, a Platonist, and, and uh, that'll poison the well. So the tactic here is to attack my person. He needs to attack the arguments, not the person, and not do what he is guilty. He accuses me of doing, and he's guilty of doing, poisoning the well and um, uh, just attacking my person ad, ad, ad hominem. So I'm going to stick with what the, the argument's about, what our discussion's about. We each have presuppositions with which we interpret Scripture. We both True. believe our assumptions and interpretive principles derive from God's Word. We both claim that we use God's word to arrive at where we're at in order to understand the truth of what God has presented. Yep. Now, <clears throat> we have the same starting point, the scriptures, but we have different ending points. And my, if my opponent were to look at scripture... Which says it all, right? Isn't that amazing? Too bad there wasn't a way for this very powerful God to make it more clear so people could start at the same spot and get to the same conclusion and say that God has changed his mind about something, didn't know something, had to learn, make mistakes, etc. I'd just simply respond by saying God communicates uh, to us anthropomorphically and that we ought not to think that God goofs and slaps his celestial forehead when something doesn't go as he expects. I don't affirm the Homer Simpson theological perspective where God says, don't. <laughs> See, in our world... That's a good one. Good one, Matt. Because I, I agree. Open theism is a bit like that. It creates two people in the garden, if you believe that, and... And then they sin, and God goes, don't. Didn't see that coming. See, when I was a Christian, I would agree with Matt Slick so strongly here. I cannot believe in a God that would go, don't. I didn't see that coming. Like, even if you're an open theist, I think you would have to say God could have predicted that if you put this tree there, that they're going to grab that fruit, and they're going to probably be, be tempted. You know, even if I, I don't see the future, but I can, I can see that coming. Because, you know, I created Satan and I, as an angel, and then he fell. And I, so I get, I, from past experience, I know these things happen. So, God's anthropomorphic condescension, he appears to change his mind, tests people to find out things, and adapts to our actions. That is perfectly consistent with the anthropomorphic interpretation of Scripture. After all, he is speaking to us in terms we would understand in our time frame. Now, at this point, I'd like to say that I'll be stretching the meaning of the word anthropomorphic to include varying ways in which God condescends to communicate to us on our levels. So please be ready with that for that. But the oh, yeah, Chris, uh, welcome. Um, maybe it will go faster if I play more of this. I'll play the two openings and the back and forth, some of it. If there's timestamps, Chris, that you want me to play, I'll play it. And Matt, if you're here too... I'd love to have all three of you on, and I'll be the, the middle referee uh, between you two. Someone, if someone has Matt Slick's ear, 
uh, email address or Twitter account if he if he does that. Let him know that we're offering him this opportunity. Open theist, from what I understand, will say that God actually learned what people decided to do, that he was ignorant and that he increased in knowledge. At this point, I'm reminded of what the fourth president of the Mormon Church said. That's Wil Wilfred Woodruff, that God is increasing in knowledge. The view of God, their view, like the open theist, uh, is in error. From what I see in open theism, it appears that billions of God's choices depend on quadrillions of man's choices. In other words, God's sovereignty is affected by man's free will. To the open theist, God's sovereignty... See, he said this is not about Calvinism, but this is where the Calvinistic thought is playing into his uh, theology. I really believe that. Like, he mentioned the word sovereignty. For Calvinists, sovereignty is everything. Everything, everything. Sovereignty leads to grace. Grace leads to, uh, basically, no merit on your own. Sovereignty is not above man's sovereignty. So we each have our proof texts and our response to our opponent's proof texts. But the critical issue here is not what the scripture says. I mean, it really is. But the, our perspective of the views of God that interprets the scriptures that we believe in. After all, the open theist who says that God must learn and make mistakes will interpret scripture in favor of that position. Likewise, as a classical theologian, I teach that God does not You know, as an atheist and a former Christian, here's my question for both of Chris and Matt. You both claim to be Christians, yes? Yes. You both claim to have the Holy Spirit within you, yes? Yes. What's the problem here? Why is the Holy Spirit guiding you to opposite truths? Or at least not opposite, but different truths. Is the Holy Spirit malfunctioning? Is it because of your sin? Is it because of Matt Slick's internal sin that he's not seeing clearly that open theism is true? Is it because of Chris Fisher's sin in his life that he's not seen that Matt Slick's Calvinistic view of the Bible is true? Holy Spirit, we need you to help us come to the right conclusion. Now, I apologize for that maybe condescending, sarcastic, atheistic tone. But really, that's, that's a good question, right? For an atheist to ask both of you? Make mistakes. Uh, I will interpret Scripture in favor of that position. We both claim our positions are derived from Scripture, and that's a bit of a conundrum so far. We can argue interpretations of Scripture all night and get nowhere, but in my opinion, the two elephants in the room are our opposing views of God that profoundly influence our interpretation of Scripture. Mm -hmm. In my corner is the view where God knows all things, 1 John 3, 20 is without limit, 1 Kings 8, 27, and I'll stop reading each verse location because I have them here. We can go through them later. God does not change. God does not make mistakes. Is not contingent. Is He is eternal. He is everywhere. He is forever and ever. Is infinite. God's understanding is infinite. He's the most absolute being. Is most wise, and He works all things after the counsel of His will. And He's also the most high God, which implies there's other gods out there. Right, Matt. Now, from these scriptures, I believe that God is omniscient, who does not increase in knowledge, as Mormonism teaches. Uh, <clears throat> but has decreed all events from eternity past and is sovereign over human free will choices. In my opponent's corner is the view that God... Yeah, free, sovereign over free will choices. To me, that's, that is so close to a contradiction. I won't call it a contradiction. But if you're sovereign, meaning that you decree it, foreknow it, everything he decrees and foreknows will happen, otherwise God knew wrong. So every action that God has decreed and foreknown, like rape, murder, pedophilia, has happened because God decreed it, foreknew it, and created it anyhow, set the, the ball rolling for it to happen. This is why people can't be Calvinists. A lot of Christians can't be Calvinists, because they cannot stomach that. God increases in knowledge, must learn what free will choices among creatures will be, adapts to those choices, can make mistakes, make bad choices, and cannot know in advance what human free will choices will be. Now, there's a debate on that with what he says. But we'll find out if that's exactly uh, what he's saying. I'm not trying to misrepresent him. And please correct me if I'm in error on that particular uh, sub-point. But nevertheless, when I come to Scripture and I see that God changes his mind. Uh, Waxican, are you saying that this is what Matt Slick said? That he can actually... Come? Mind or relents or repents, I see anthropomorphisms. After all, when God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, that was anthropomorphic. 
when he talked to them that was anthropomorphic. After he, they sinned and he hid themselves, God asked, where are you? Wait a minute, wait a minute. When God talked to people, that's anthropomorphic? Does Matt Slick literally believe that God spoke to Moses through the burning bush or not? Like, did the bush actually literally create sound waves that hit Moses' ears or not? I don't know. Does, could someone tell me if Matt believes that? Well, that was an anthropomorphic expression. After all, God knew exactly where Adam was. So we see that God has condescended to speak to us, and he does so in different ways. In fact, he asks questions which he knows the answer to, like, Adam, where are you? In fact, the Bible itself is an anthropomorphism since it's God's ways of communicating to us on our level. And, of course, the greatest anthropomorphism of all is the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's natural to see varying degrees of anthropomorphic communications in the scriptures because it is ultimately anthropomorphic. Therefore, we will read statements that will range from crystal... Yeah. Isn't there a... Someone who's more knowledgeable about the Old Testament than, than me can um, tell me about this, but uh, was it Christy Hayes, I think, mentioned something about... you? There's We've dug up artifacts of huge footprints that allude to these are the footprints of God in the Garden of Eden. So I think if you could have a time machine and go back 4,000 years or whatever, 3,000 years... The authors actually thought God, yeah, God actually did walk in the garden. God actually did ask Adam, where are you? Well, clarity to paradoxes, our doctrine of God will affect where we draw these lines. That is why I think the real issue here is our theological framework about God, because that's exactly what the topic is about. He has a philosophical understanding of God, as do I. Yep. At this point, we're to, to uh, back one of those two elements in the room, not both. Now, from what I've learned about open theists, they insist that in classical theism, if God has advanced knowledge of all people's free will choices, then they're not free to make different choices when the time arises to make those choices. But I see no logical necessity for this conclusion. Now, I, I yeah, see, I, I do. I do see a logical necessity for that conclusion, especially if you define free will as the ability to have done otherwise. Now, you have to define it in terms of coercion in order to get out of it. But if you define free will as, I could have chosen the steak or the chicken. Oh, I chose the chicken. But I could have chosen the steak. I could have done otherwise. Now, if God knows I'm going to choose the chicken even before I'm born, then what's going to happen when I make that choice? It's going to be the chicken. Otherwise, God foreknew wrong. So if God does know the future, whatever he knows to be will happen. And that means you cannot have done otherwise, which means you do not have free will in that libertarian sense. But I think Matt Slick doesn't define free will that way. He defines it as, I think he defines it in this uh, debate here. I admit there are different uh, open theists with slightly different variations, and we'll find out where he sits uh, among these. But nevertheless, see, I've yet to find an open theist who proposes a set of premises that, log that necessarily result in the conclusion that God can't know what we decide in advance. After all, if he knows what we will do in any circumstance, then that means he already knows what we'll do in any situation. I don't Perhaps. think an open theist would say it's impossible for a God to know what would happen in advance, but they just would say this is not the God they believe in. That's my opponent, will provide something like a set of premises that logically necess necessitate his position. In fact, I hope he does. I hope some open theists would try it. But from what I understand of open theism also, God does not uh, know what free will choices any person will absolutely make then oh, I got a lot of questions and we'll get into those later. Likewise, fallen man also has free will that operates under the sovereignty of God, just like Jesus' own free will operated under the sovereignty of God. Human free will is not independent from God. That is not possible. God is the ultimate cause as well as the proximate cause of our choices. Ult yeah, that's the Calvinist mindset. God is the ultimate cause of your choices. To me, that's just science. That's... If, if this God, if Matt Slick's God exists, it just follows that when you choose to rape, I'm sure there's no rapist in the live stream right now, but if, if a person were to choose to rape, ultimately, God caused that. Why? Because God foresaw it before he even created the universe, saw that that was going to happen, said, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to create this universe anyway even though it, this is going to happen. And he could have chosen not to create the universe, 
which means he is ultimately the cause and responsible for every rape, murder, child molestation. And this is why Christians are not Calvinists, because they can't stomach that. Choices we make exist within a causal chain that traces themselves back to the ultimate initiator of all things, God. So no human choice is independent or autonomous from God. But I get the impression that open theists have it both ways. They say that God's choice depends on man's choice. Or let me put it another way, in open theism, God's sovereignty depends on man's sovereignty. Yeah, but that's the Old Testament is full of examples of that, Matt. And I think Chris will bring some examples later. The whole Old Testament. See, this is the problem I have with Christians. They say that the Bible's consistent. This is going to get both sides, Matt, both Chris Fisher and Matt Slick mad, but... They have this idea that the Bible is consistent from Genesis to Revelation, but it isn't. In the Old Testament, it is, you obey me, I will bless you. You do not obey me, I will curse you, says Yahweh. It is based on what you do. In the New Testament, it's not based on what you do. You can do no good. Unless the Holy Spirit regenerates you. I'm talking from the Calvinist perspective. And um, see, Noah was saved. Noah and his family was saved because of their righteousness. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, humans are saved because they're unrighteous. Noah was saved because he's righteous. New Testament Christians are saved because they're unrighteous. That to me, is a very simple illustration of the inconsistency of the Bible. Now, from what I see in Scripture, God elected individuals from before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, Romans 8, 29. He predestined Herod and Pontius Pilate to do what he wanted them to do. You go to Acts 4, 27, 28. And that we were crucified with Christ, Romans 6, 6. And Romans 6, 8, we died with Christ. We can get into these particulars. Now, to reiterate, foundational to our interpretation of Scripture is our perspective views of God, our respective views of God. What can God know and not know? What Actually, a good question, and I don't know the answer to this. Chris, maybe you can answer this. Um, what is the Orthodox Jewish view? Like, are most Orthodox Jews open theists? Be, I don't know the answer to this, but my guess is no. So then the question is, if I'm right, that most Orthodox Jews are not open theists, the question is, why? And if I'm right that they're not, maybe open theists' interpretation of the Old Testament is wrong. By the way, I, I think the open theist interpretation of the Old Testament is right, but maybe Orthodox Jews have the same problem Matt Slick does, they just can't stomach this idea that God is like Super Thor. What can God do and not do? Is God limited to the present, or is God not restricted by the present and the physical realm? Now, you've got to understand, when he says, I'm platonic, he is inserting certain philosophical values in order to poison the well and try and make what I say invalid. Yet, he does not recognize his own philosophical assumptions and impositions within the scripture that are imposed upon the nature of God himself. He can't have it both ways. He's got to recognize that he is imposing a certain presuppositional base to, to the scriptures. He can say they're derived from scripture, but so can I. I guess they mine are as well. Anyway, I would say that my open theist opponent limits God to the created order, has him constrained by time, renders him incapable of knowing the future exhaustively and perfectly, attributes to him mistakes and failed expectations. Yeah, and this is what Chris uh, predicted he'd say um, in Chris's opening. This is the God that, that Matt Slick doesn't like. He does not like a God like that, that has limits, that learns. Don't like it, so I'm not going to believe it. But what if it's true, Matt? This seems more like the Greek gods than the God of Scripture. Yeah. In fact, I can't help but wonder if the open theist view of God is because of their view of man, Christian humanist thought. I don't believe he understands that he's doing that himself. We can talk about that later. After all, they believe that for human choice to be free, God can't know the future. I see their assumptions starting with man's ability and man's freedom, not God's greatness and sovereignty. I, on the other hand, start with God and look to man. Look and then look at man. I don't believe I'm wrong when I use God as the standard of free will, knowledge, and more. He is the sovereign king, not us, not our free will. One more sentence, two more sentences. I reject as heresy the open theist view of God. I reject the idea that God makes mistakes, learns, and could even make false prophets. Okay, here's my advice as an atheist to Christians. Get rid of the word heresy. 
I mean, I know it makes you feel good to call other people her heretics, but, you know, it doesn't really aid to the dialogue, to the conversation. It's like sitting down with someone at a bar and having a political conversation, and you're just saying, you're stupid. But let's have a cordial conversation now. Let's see. I reject the idea that human choice is the ultimate standard by which God's knowledge must be framed. But it's, i got to admit, it is fun calling people stupid, and it's fun calling people heretics, so maybe Matt's just doing it for the dopamine hit. Reject open theism. It must die. It must die. <laughs> Thank you so much for that opening statement. Appreciate you guys. All right, so now we are going to go to a 60-minute uh, open discussion, free-flowing discussion. Uh, also, there may be you're responding to that question. Don't be dragging out your question. Let's get to it, sum it up, and get right to the next one, all right? Uh, one thing I noticed, Chris, uh, I know you're in the live stream chat here. Um, <clears throat> did, weren't you guys supposed to do like 30 minutes Matt asking you questions and 30 minutes you asking Matt questions? Or was it totally open? Because it seemed to me Matt asked you more qu questions than you asked Matt questions, but I could be wrong. Uh, that said, also, let me address the live audience before we go. Live audience, hey, you guys be nice out there. We, and once again, you define what free will is. We need disrespectful ad hominems between each other, all right? So go ahead. You guys got it for 60 minutes. Okay, I got a question then. Chris, can you define what free will is? Hey, hey Chris, I think you muted. I got 15 drinks so far. The audience is probably dying right now. <laughs> So free will is just a concept. Uh, we find free will in the Bible because God, God makes man and then regrets his own action in making man. And so free will is not a thing. Uh, God's not privy to whatever else there is out there. He's not privy to predestination or eternal settled future. And in fact, in the flood, what happens is God lowers his standard based on what he learns about mankind. He decides to save mankind forever for the same reason he destroyed them, that they have evil in their hearts from their youth. He learns something about man and lowers his standards. So God's not privy to whatever faded future you think there is, is exists. Can you please define what free will is? Yeah, see, uh, with all due respect, uh, Chris, in my opinion, what you did here was not good. It was wrong. It was bad. Uh, I know why you did it, I think because you didn't want to get down that rabbit hole of defining everything, and then it becomes very philosophical, and then before you know it, you forget what the real point and issue is. I've been there. I've done that. I, I get it. But uh, in my opinion, if Matt asks you what is free will, just answer it. It's the ability to have done otherwise, which is not Matt's definition of free will. Um, but maybe that's not your definition of free will either. That you, you, you brought up the concept. When did I use the concept of free will? God's not just privy you, to a settled future. I'm just asking you, can I, you define what free will you is? Could, you use your own definition. I'll accept whatever you say. You don't know what free will is as an open thing. Yeah, actually, that's not a bad response, Chris. I'll go with ever, any definition you choose. Just. No, you, listen, so my opening said that you only care about philosophical concepts. The Bible doesn't talk about free will. It sometimes talks about free will op, uh, offerings. It talks about people choosing. God doesn't have knowledge of what people are going to do. So in that sense, yeah, there's, there's some concepts in there that God doesn't have access to any settled future. And so can you deal with those concepts or do you want a, like a philosophical discussion? Um, <clears throat> I'm not the one who started off with insults, and I didn't call you a liar as you called me. And you didn't I'm not start. the one who said what. Yeah. And I'm not the one who said that I only care about philosophy that you only do. Uh, I care about scriptures, and if you study anything that I write, it's always a, it's always about scripture. So I, I'm going to take not. it you don't know what free will is. All right. So <laughs> does God exhaustively know Himself? Uh, God done, did not know mankind was going to fail in Genesis six. He says, I regret my own decision in creating man uh, because they are so wicked. He regrets his own actions. And so whatever model you have. The See, Chris, I think you could answer, yes, God does exhaustively know himself. In other words, I, I know you feel like Matt's trying to trap you here, but just walk into his trap. It's fine. If you've got the truth on your side, it won't matter. Biblical authors do not share your model. 
uh, does God know himself exhaustively? It's a simple question. Yeah, these are philosophical questions. The biblical authors don't talk like this. It's a category error. You're talking it's in false category categories. Error. It's because you've got it's not a category error. Concepts. You don't care about the biblical concepts. God does not have access yeah. to... I would, have, I would love if Matt Slick were here and asked the same questions he asked Chris, and I could pretend to be an open theist and answer some unique future timeline that exists. He regrets his own actions, Genesis 6. Hey, um, Marlon, can you please instruct yes. him to not attack my person and tell me what I do? Yeah, I understand, Chris. It's, it's, what does it even mean to uh, ask, does God exhaustively know himself? But you could ask that. What, what exactly do you mean by that question? Now, I'm just giving constructive criticism, Chris. Please don't take any offense to anything I say. Uh, again, I like you. I don't think you're a bad guy. I, I lean towards your position. My bias is that you're more correct than Matt when it, when it comes to the Old Testament. But I actually think Matt's more correct than you when it comes to the New Testament because the New Testament was heavily influenced by the Greeks. Don't care about. All right. Yeah, I, I can evaluate. Know. I'm sitting here. All right. Let's make sure we're attacking the arguments. No personal accusations, guys. Right. All right. So your right. philosophy okay. is not biblical. And so when you talk in these categories, you're not talking in biblical theology. You're talking in a humanism. You're talking in platonic categories. Okay, what's a platonic category? Uh, like perfect being theology, where you have to maximize God's greatness based on some sort of metaphysical value system where you're trying to get the top value and that's what God is. Or the idea that, oh, let's let's talk about truth values of future prophets. The Bible does not talk like this. These people did not have that as part of their worldview. Okay. This is not biblical theology. Do you believe in the Trinity? Yeah. Do you use reason to arrive at the Trinity? Do I? Uh, no, I, I look at the biblical data. It seems that Paul talks about an incarnate deity, which is not Platonism, by the way. In Platonism, the physical and spiritual can't have overlap. In Jewish theology, they can. That's why. That's why people like uh, James White will not answer the question: Was the human part of Jesus God? They won't answer the question because it it, it, it contradicts their their. That's a great question, by the way, Chris. I'm going to use that in the future. Was the human part of Jesus God? They, <laughs> they have to answer yes in a way, but in a way, if they answer yes, uh, that means God can die? God, the all-powerful creator, in their view, can die? This gets to atonement theory, too. I mean, I've said this many times. It seems like death is a separation from God, but yet physical death was needed for sins to be cleansed, according to Matt Slick. So it's the death and resurrection of a piece of meat, of carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. You have to kill carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, and then resurrect it in order for sins to be atoned for? Or, does, or do people like Matt Slick say, no, Jesus actually didn't have to die physically in order for your sins to be atoned for? It's more of a spiritual death, like a separation from God. If that's the case, then why put your son through the torturous death on the cross? It's a no-win situation for theists, for Christians, uh, for the, with that question. Venus metaphysics, which God can't share with humanity because that adds parts, that denies divine simplicity. Again, these are not biblical categories. Did Jesus know um, himself, uh, what he'd be choosing to do on earth all the time? He's God. Well, no, you, you go, you go look, look at what happens. He doesn't want to go to the cross. He prays for God to let him out of it. Uh, he doesn't know the time and the date if you of the second coming. Yeah, and Jesus even lied. He said he was going to go to a feast. He, he said he wasn't going to go to the feast because uh, his time hadn't come or whatever. But then he ends up going to the feast. Did he know he was going to change his mind? Did he just change his mind or did he lie, knowing that he would go to the feast, even though he told his disciples he wasn't going to go to the feast? Jesus doesn't know things within the Bible. It's admitted in the Bible. So whatever category um, of omniscience you hold, Jesus doesn't have it. So the reason he didn't know the day nor the hour um, is because of the, it's a wedding feast idiom. I've taught on this many times, yeah, wedding feast. and I can explain it to you, but it would be uh, you know not conducive to time right now. You see, Jesus, uh, he had free will because he's God, which you can't even define. Oh, oh that, yeah. See, listen to what Matt did. 
I've taught on this many times, and I can explain it to you, but it would be uh, you know, not conducive to time right See, now. See, Matt, Matt, you got to stop doing this. Uh, you got this uh, thing in your head that it really comes off like, I'm better than you. I can teach you this. Uh, it takes too much time here, but... Uh, let's go offline and I, I will do a Bible study and catch you up. I'll, I will impart the vast sums of knowledge I have in my brain and I will perfectly transfuse my knowledge into the brain of those who don't think like me. That's how you come across, Matt. Now, for guys like Chris and me, it doesn't really affect us because we know who we are. We're real men, right? But, you know, for a lot of other people, it's like, uh, it's condescending. You see, Jesus, uh, he had free will because he's God, which you can't even define free will. And I ask you if God knows himself exhaustively, and you deny doing that because he knows himself, because the Spirit of God, Scripture says, that the Spirit knows the mind of God. So we can say from Scripture that God knows himself exhaustively, because that's what the Bible right. says. All right, great. Now, Paul, if God Paul knows himself said, exhaustively, and Jesus, and you don't even know how the Trinity's arrived yet, apparently. Uh, I don't know if you even know how it's derived, because uh, you have to use logic and Scripture to do that. I don't know if you're aware of this, but I just don't know. We could discuss that sometime so here's my question up the drink okay. counter. so perhaps you might want to focus on the arguments and discussion instead of trying to address the the you're audience not making arguments you have to question so i you, asked you and then I you asked you some claims i've asked you questions and you're not able right. to answer the questions they're not so, biblical questions did, they're so, not about the bible ask, they're about your philosophy why do i care about ask, your philosophy if to ask if In jesus bible, had free will is not in a good question. The Bible, yes, Jesus had free will. He didn't want to go to the cross. Okay, good. He but what is free will? Not to go to the cross. He didn't have to go to the cross. God has okay. contingencies. God has possibilities. God did not have to send Jesus to the cross. Wow. Really? Wow. Um, Jesus says, "Not so, my will, but yours be done." He so much that so that God does not fulfill his prayer. He says, if "See, for Christians like Matt Slick to hear Chris say, Jesus." did not have to die on the cross. I mean, that's, that's the worst thing you can say to them. I mean, to them, it's like, no, that's the only way we can have salvation. And if you're saying that wasn't necessary, I mean, yeah, this is where they call Chris a heretic. If there's any way to have this cup pass for me, let's do that, but not my will, but yours to be done. He adds that because he's hedging against God changing his plan radically okay. in order to uh, do what Jesus wants. They have different wills. They want different things, right? Wow. And so God, Jesus doesn't think the cross is faded. He thinks that legions of angels can save him from the cross. Jesus does not share your philosophy. Yeah, okay, earlier I said the New Testament is more uh, influenced by the Greeks, but I, I agree with Chris here. Like, that's in the scriptures. That And you can very easily interpret it that way, that Jesus held out hope that maybe I don't have to suffer like this. Maybe I will be saved. But in the end, not my will, but yours be done, God. Uh, so you said Jesus had free will. So I'll offer you one more time. You said it. Can you define what free will is? Jesus was didn't believe in a faded future timeline and had no access to it. Uh, neither did God. There, there's only free will. There's, there's not another option. There, there, there's, not, there's not a fatalistic worldview that, that's at play that, that can be an option. He, he yeah, can I don't do hold what a he fatalistic wants. fatalistic worldview. But I'm asking you... Uh, but you kind of do, Matt. You kind of do. If you believe God knows the future and the future's set, everything that's going to happen is going to happen because God foreknew and decreed it to happen. How are you not a fatalist? Ultimately, can someone explain that to me, how Matt is not a fatalist? See, I'm a determinist as well, but the reason why I'm not a fatalist is because I'm not omniscient. And so I act like I'm free and that things could have been otherwise, even though it might not be. But for God and Matt Slick's view of God, he knows everything. So ultimately, and if Matt believes that, then... I mean, you're down the road, the slippery slope of fatalism, I think. Basic term, you're using the terms. I'm asking you to define them. Let's, since you, you do it from the Trinity, right? You do it from the yeah, Trinity. When the Bible talks about free will off, uh, offering, it means that someone's doing it volitionally. It's, it's their own choice to do that. Okay. So do you affirm that Jesus has two natures? I actually think Chris and Matt have the same definition of free will. 
based on what Chris just said? Um, sure. What do you mean by nature? Are you serious? Uh, yeah, what, are you, have a what are you using? Because it's a non guess what? It's a non-tological essence categories? the nature of something of which properties emanate. So does Jesus have where, a divine where, nature? Where are you getting these definitions? Does, does Jesus have a divine nature and a human nature? Right, because in the Semitic worldview, the divine can overlap with the physical. And so that's what Paul is talking about. He's, he's, he's against the Platonist metaphysics in which the two, two can't overlap. So was the human part of Jesus God to Paul in uh, uh, Colossians 2? Was the human part God? No, humanity is not divined by its nature. Jesus had two distinct oh, yeah. natures. It's called a hypostatic human, union, which means Jesus in the one person, in the one person are two distinct natures, and the in the properties of each nature are ascribed to the single person. That's called the communication of the properties. This right, is basic Christian theology. Yeah, I don't know that whole term. When you, hypostatic union to me is just a fancy term for a paradox or a contradiction. Like if you, if Matt Slick honestly believes there's two distinct natures within Jesus, the human and the divine, he actually has to think that the, it's the human part of Jesus that's more important than the divine. Because it was the human part of Jesus that had to die on the cross for the sins of the world, not the divine part. Isn't that funny? That... A divine, a rebellion against God, which is volition, which is mind-centered, a mind choice, which a lot of Christians would say is intangible, not material. That is atoned for with flesh? Interesting. Colossians 2, he's arguing against you because you're the tell you what. That's who he's arguing tell against. You what. Why don't you and I sometime have a little discussion on biblical theology and the person of there Jesus and the Trinity? Because I'd like to do that with you if you're interested in that. Because I don't think you understand biblical theology in this regard. So uh, He would never say that to me, though, Chris, because I'm an atheist. So he doesn't do Bible studies with atheists. Or is that Cy Ten Brueggen and Kate? Jesus has two distinct natures. Okay. Now, you, you still can't define free will, so I'll I step in and that. I'll do it. I, didn't, I never made the claim God or Jesus has two distinct natures. In the Semitic mind, the, the human nature is not... Uh, a huge chasm between that and the divine. There's overlap. That's why Paul writes that the fullness of God, divinity, was in Jesus physically. He's not a Platonist. He's a Semitic uh, scholar. He, he's a Pharisee. Yeah, I'm not a Gnostic. I can start saying things about you. I'm not a Gnostic like you are, or I, I'm I not a, I uh, a nihilist. I could say all kinds of things like this and throw out words. I don't think you understand what they mean. Do you affirm or do you deny that Jesus presently has two hey, distinct hey, natures? Hey, hey, Matt, hold on. Hey, Chris, let's chill on the paddle with the drink sign on it. Let, I really want you guys I'm to sorry. have a fruitful discussion. Let's let's try to be chill on that um, so we can uh, act, interact with it fairly, all right? Yeah, show some respect. Do you affirm <laughs> or deny that Jesus has two natures? Matt, start respecting. If you want respect, I'll give you respect, but you have to show some in return. You haven't been doing that. You've been talking about Mormonism. You've been saying, Chris, why didn't you just say I deny it at that point? I do not say at least I deny it in the in the terms that you use it as two distinct natures that you view it as as more uh, of a synergy, I guess, if that's what you believe. And, oh, you don't understand these things. My philosophy. That's not respectful, Matt. Start being respectful. I'll start respecting you. We could start over. We could have a respectful conversation. No ad hominems, but you need to control yourself. <laughs> Your hypocrisy is loud and clear since you called me a liar. And uh, you, you are. should really look. Okay, guys. All right. All right. Look, this all is right, ridiculous. Guys. This guy, let's, look, let's, if, if we don't get a handle on this, this isn't going to work. If this guy's going to continue to attack my person, to insult okay. me, and to not. Chris, what you should have said is. Matt, you're not a liar. <clears throat> you just don't speak the truth. <laughs> There's a difference because one's about motive. and Because I, I think Matt honestly believes what he's saying. Now, you can say, Chris, that you think he's mistaken and wrong. But in order to call Matt a liar, you have to say that Matt knows better. I guess you're giving, giving Matt more credit than I would. I guess by calling him a liar, you're saying that Matt does know better and still saying uh, these wrong things. Answer questions because he's not capable of even answering the basic questions. Why are we? Why should we continue? This is ridiculous. Okay. This right. guy needs right. to to mature up and start stop being a child.
All right, guys, check this out. Check this out. I just want you guys to be able to deal with what we're talking about. We're talking about open theism and Bible and the Bible. All right. So let's yep. make sure the conversation stays there. The, the, little, the Bible, little jabs. Yes. And this is for both of you guys. The little jabs, little comments here and there. Let's chill on all of that. Let's get this under control. Both of you are adults. Let's behave as such so we can have a fruitful conversation. We're both here. Matt, wife. Uh Chris says, I have multiple videos exposing his lies. YouTube, Matt, slick lies to avoid a question. Yeah, I, I would say that, and that you might have all that and uh, have good evidence that he lies. But I mean, to say someone is a liar means you, you almost have to get inside their head to know their intent, that they actually know, truly, truly, truly know X and they're saying Y or they're saying not X. And that's a big burden to, to overcome. I think the vast majority of time the word lie is, liar is used in the world. What people really mean is they're mistaken. They're wrong. They're not speaking the truth, which are all different than lying. It doesn't have to be, but it can be is in another room not feeling too well he's here chris you have a family you could be doing having time with right now but you guys took time away from your families to be able to have fun in this conversation let's put aside any past transitions or uh, uh transgressions you guys might have interacted with later earlier let's focus on what we're talking about here come on it's not just you guys it's the audience trying to entertain as well remember there's somebody out there that have no idea what open theism is and they would like to know so let's focus okay. on the questions and let's have fun yeah, so in Deuteronomy 8, 2, it says, You shall remember the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So my question to Matt Slick is, this, is there any dependent clauses or independent clauses or oh, adverbial clauses within that sentence that tells us why God led Israel through the wilderness? And without setting the context with that in mind, I can't give you an answer. Yeah. Well, I, I could just read it again. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Are there any clauses, independent oh, or dependent or adverbial, that explains why sure he you, led them in the wilderness? I'm not sure which part of syntax you want me to address as dependent clause or adverbial clause. Perhaps you might Is there want a to reason that the verse gives no. why God led them through the wilderness? Well, from what you are reading, it says that it was to uh, test them to know what was in their heart. Boom. Done. Why did God lead the Israelites through the wilderness? To know what's in their heart. Now, if you read that at face value, it seems to me that God didn't know what was in their heart, so he had to test them lead them through the wilderness to find out. That's the face value, like uh, interpretation. I don't have the Holy Spirit in me, so of course you gotta take this with a grain of salt, but the clear reading, of the face value reading of the text is, this is why God did this. He didn't know what was in the hearts of the Israelites. He had to find out. So he led them through the wilderness. He tested them. And they mostly failed. But Matt can't swallow that. Matt would have to say, well, God really knew what was in their hearts. He tested them only so they could find out something about themselves. That would be the apologetic he would use. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> do you believe that the author thought that God had this ungenerated, non-discursive, eternal knowledge? Or do you think that he thought that God actually tested them in order to know what they're going to do. Uh, I can answer the question better if I understand uh, something from your perspective. Do you believe that God knows all things in the present exhaustively? And he doesn't have to. God's not a robot. And in my opening statement, I said God is not a formula. God is a person. God has volition. God doesn't have to know what's going on in Sodom. And yeah, my advice to you, Chris, is when Matt asks you a question like that, say, yes, but he doesn't have to. In other words, if he wanted to, he could exhaustively know everything in the present, but he can choose not to. Maybe I d didn't even say it in less words than you, but. And Gomorrah, if he doesn't want to. And that's why the Sodom and Gomorrah incident states that God is going down to Sodom and Gomorrah to check to see if the reports which have come to them are true. And if not, he will know it. 
So God is not everywhere, according to you? Is that it? God, it, God's not a formula. Again, my opening statement, God is not. <laughs> what you should have said, Chris, is, are you implying, Matt, that God is everywhere? And if so, is God in hell right now? Oh, that would have been fun to ask. <laughs> if God is omnipresent, and if hell is a place, is he God in hell? That's why I always love it when uh, people, Christians say, they've taken God out of the schools. They're taking prayer out of the schools. How can, if you believe in an omnipresent God, how is it even possible for those mean, evil secularists to take God out of the schools? It can't be done. Uh, sorry. Sorry for the politics. Not a formula. God could be where yeah, he, wants, he wants. God has volition. God okay. can do what I'm God wants. Yeah, I, I got that. I'm not saying God's a formula. I don't even know what that means, but I'm just asking you because you said God had to go down to find out. Was if God's everywhere, then He would already know. So I'm just I'm just wondering what's your position because you're not being clear. Yeah. If you're going to say yeah. God's omnipresent, then He's already down there. He would already know. Unless you're saying that God's down there, but He's He's just not not knowing what they're doing. Yeah, that, Chris, Chris, you should just say no. God's not everywhere. He's got to go back to talk to somebody else and say we got to go find out what they're doing. So my this is why my question is relative. Is God omnipresent? Is he everywhere? When the Bible has verses about God's reach being everywhere, that's about his power able to extend to all those places. That's not about okay. him occupying our toilets or every square inch of everything that ever exists. Yeah, so Chris, you're, you're answering, no, God is not everywhere, but he can potentially be everywhere because he's super fast or something like that. He's faster than Thor. That's how you could have answered. And I think that's more of a direct answer for him. Even classical theism denies that God occupies any space. They think omnipresence means that God is outside of time, outside of space, and doesn't have... But it is interesting that, to think that if God is omnipresent, he's actually in toilets and sewer systems. Because I think that's what Matt believes. ...relation to the material world. But the biblical concept is God's power can reach everywhere. Okay, I didn't ask if his power could. I just asked, is God everywhere? No! In the sense that his power can reach everywhere, yes. No. In the Bible. Because that, that that's means the it's a potential. Concept. So is there any place in existence in the universe of which God is not aware? It could be God's not a formula. He's a person. And so if he doesn't want to be a... Doesn't it, isn't there verses that say God will remember your sin no more? Does it actually mean that? He's not aware of your sins no more because they've been wiped clean? Is that just a euphemism? Aware of something? He's not forced to be aware of it. So... It's, and it's, so then, if he's not aware of it, he's choosing not to be aware of something? So wouldn't he have to well, know about the, it in order to know not to know about it? Our data set is the Bible, and so we could read Genesis and, and take a wow. look at what it says. Look, I'm asking you a specific question because it's a premise right. that you're working from. You're the one who brought up Sodom and Gomorrah and the idea of having to go down yeah. and check it out. Okay, great. So I'm just asking you a question. If we're going to look at the text, I want to be able to look and reason as God said. Let us reason together. In fact, in, in Acts 17, 17, Paul, dialegami, he dialogued with reason and went back and forth and did this. I'm asking you to do this. In fact, Paul the Apostle quoted Epimenides, Menander, and Erastus, pagan philosophers. He brought it up himself to discuss things with people. And you sit here and you condemn the idea of me even using what is called philosophy, which really is just logic that I'm asking you about. And then you say God's not a formula. I've asked you about God's exhaustive existence, about free will. You don't even know these things. I don't even think you understand what the hypostatic union is recurring Christ because there's a significant reason I was asking as it relates to free will, as it relates to God. You keep dodging and you don't seem to want to answer direct questions. I want to talk about so, the biblical look, text. So here's a direct this question. question. about the Bible. Is, is, yes, the Bible. the Bible says in Psalm 139, 7 through 9, that God is everywhere. Do yeah, I think Matt's right here, Chris, with all due respect. I think um, for people who already are open theists and who support you, they understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. But for someone like me or uh, someone who has zero skin in the game on either side, it does appear you're not answering questions directly. Now, I err on the side where... Uh, People will ask me questions, and I will purposely answer short, yes, no, to the point where misunderstandings happen. And I do that on purpose because I want to force people to ask follow -up, good follow-up questions, and oftentimes they don't. And so I'm often left 
being misunderstood, but I'm okay with being misunderstood because I really don't care. Affirm that no, God what do they is. Mean? In, do what you do affirm they mean? or do you affirm or do you deny that God is present in all places and all time in the universe? At the same time, he should match it at added, and then Chris, you just say no. The biblical authors don't think so. And so in Genesis 18, he says this. He says, yeah, because the outcry no. of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and this, their sin is very grave, I will go down now to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. You can't just like verse proof text where you grab one half a verse in somewhere else in the Bible and then think that that author is... Yeah, see, Chris, you basically just answered no. But I, my advice is just answer no, period, with no addition... Don't say anything else after that. Allow Matt to lead you into traps. It's fun going in traps. We're talking about your special metaphysics. They're just not talking about it. We, we talked about a ton of different examples in my opening statement of phrases, normal phrases used about human beings. Guess what? Mankind doesn't change. Mankind, mankind sees everything under the sun. The writer of Ecclesiastes has seen everything under the sun. King David knows everything on earth. So what do these phrases mean? And context is the only way to know. And so you can't take a little phrase and then claim it means your theology. It's begging the question. That's a begging the question fallacy. No, I haven't committed any fallacies like that. You don't know logic very well. So <laughs> nobody knows logic like Matt Slick's logic. No one. <laughs> Matt Slick is the uh, the Trump of biblical Calvinism. God is limited. In your view, are you saying God is limited in his his presence and his scope of in existence? Not my view. The author of Genesis 18's view. I, yeah. I, see, Matt, uh, Chris, you should have just said yes. He is limited. Just give Matt Slick what he wants. Matt, oh, so that's what you're saying. So your answer, your answer is yes. So God is not everywhere. Okay. And so then he has to go learn. All right. That's what Genesis 18 reads. I could read it again. Yeah. Not what you say. That's your interpretation of things. Because I can show you where 1 John 3.20, God knows all things. I can show where he decrees yeah, all things from all existence. Man knows all things. Well, we've been and, over yeah, this. You and I. Yeah, well, you, you and I have talked about this. Well, that's good. So... I'm going to ask you actually. Again. What's that verse? John two. John two all point, man knows all. Did it again. Not, not what you say. That's your interpretation of things, because I can show you where First John three twenty. God knows all things. I can show where He decrees yeah, all John things from all point, existence. Man knows all things. Well, we've been and, over yeah, this. You and I. Yeah, well, you, you and I have talked about this. Well, that's good. So I'm going to ask you again, because this is important. I'm going to ask you this question. Does and I'm going to just clarify for what it is you hold to, for your open theist position. Do you affirm or do you deny that in order for man to have free will, which you can't deny, I mean, you can't even define, that for man to have free will choices, that God can't know what those choices are going to be? Is that what you uh, affirm John, or do you not affirm it? First John 2.20, man knows all things. You have the anointing and you know all things. Again, proof text trumping or just quoting something out of context and pretending it means your theology is not acceptable. This is not a biblical dialogue. Show from the context why the author has your particular interpretation in mind. You can't just assume these things. This is a dialogue. It's not much of a dialogue. Um, so I'm not pretending. You call me a liar and said I'm pretending. I wish you would stop giving me <coughs> these things. I've asked you specifically for definitions and you've not given me these definitions. Why would I define something that's not like talked about in the Bible? Yeah, I just looked up First uh, John two twenty, and um, it doesn't say you have all knowledge. All men have knowledge, but my guess is it depends on what version you read, right? Free will is a modern category that we're using. There's no other option but to the biblical authors. We all have volition. Define, God doesn't he, know what mankind's going to do before He does it, and He regrets making okay. mankind and destroys them all. Okay, That's so God, God doesn't know. What man will do. Right. Okay. And so because of that. Yeah. Again, I agree with Chris here. You just read it. If you have any reading comprehension skills at all and you read the uh, Noah's Ark story, it's pretty clear that God goes, Oy vey, what have I done with these stupid humans? They're evil. I got to get rid of them and they're destroy them all and start again. I mean, sorry for the Jewish uh, Yiddish, but. Jews wrote it, so. Um, yeah, the, God regretted it. And it makes, and Chris's view on the Old Testament especially makes way more sense 
falls more in line than no god really didn't regret it uh he didn't really repent of of making humans he he knew what was going to happen it was part of his big plan to build up the population of humans and then reduce it down to seven was it seven and then rebuild it again yeah it sounds inefficient yes but you know god doesn't care about efficiency god doesn't know so is it because man's free will has to be free otherwise the standard thing i've heard let me rephrase it the standard thing i've heard from open theists is that in order for man to be truly free god can't know his free will choices otherwise he's not free to make a different choice when it comes time to make that choice do you agree with that i do no i i, I told everyone that you're going to call me a mormon and bring up mormonism and that happened so i knew your free will choices before you made them it's not hard Normal people do it all the time. This is how we operate in the world. We know the future. You even told me when we were talking. Yeah, see, I disagree with this. It depends on your definition of knowledge, and this gets into philosophy. But um, to say you are you know something infallibly, which is what Matt, when you say the word knowledge, Chris, knowing things, when, when Matt hears that, God knows something, he views that as infallibly. So if God knows your future choices, Chris, guess what? You're going to do exactly what God foreknew you would do. Because if you don't, then God knew wrong and God never knows wrong. Therefore, you're not free in the libertarian sense. And this is what Matt was asking you about. Now, if you're saying knowledge is like being 98% confident as a predictor, then that's different. And I think that's what you mean by knowledge. All humans don't have infallible knowledge. And so therefore, under Matt's definition, one could say humans don't know anything unless it's been revealed to them perfectly from the creator of the universe, which is what Calvinists believe. That uh, Jason, the camera guy, that you knew that he was going to go home that night because you understand that the definition of knowledge includes this fallible uh, correspondence or something that with something that happens Human beings know the future regularly. God knows. Yeah, I understand, Chris. Um, changing definition of knowledge. Yeah, this is why debates like this can be so tedious and, and problematic is because your definition of knowledge and Matt's defini definition of knowledge are two different things. Knows the future regularly. I listed about five, four different ways where how God knows things. And it knows things especially about the future. God knows because he sees, he knows because he predicts, he knows because he's going to do stuff. I know things about the future. Someone in the comments there uh, made a false accusation that uh, I had a video about Trump winning the 2020 election. The video was actually about, there was a predict it in which Trump would retain office in 2019. And I was absolutely correct in what I claimed about that. So I knew the future, something I have no control of. I just was able to predict the way things were going. Is it the case? or not the case? I'm asking a specific question. Is it the case or not the case that in order for human free will to be free, God cannot know in advance what specific choices we'll make? I would agree with that. I would affirm that. If God knows the future perfectly, without any doubt, without any fallibility, we are not free. In the libertarian sense, we cannot do otherwise. God knows a lot of stuff we're going to do. Uh, I Does he know it or predict it, Chris? You know the law of stuff we're going to do. So here, here's, the, here's the thing. You're not answering there, the question. There, there's, a conflation. there's a conflation. And what happens, it's a bait and switch, a moat and bailey, in which you want one standard of knowledge when we're talking about how people normally know the future. But then you bait and switch it. You switch it with a different type of knowledge that God has. And the type of knowledge you want to ascribe to God is unfalsifiable, yep. eternal, ungenerated, independent, non-discursive knowledge that somehow infallible. has all truth values of all future truth propositions that infallibly will occur. Yeah, see, Chris, uh, from what you just said, you understand Matt's definition of knowledge. So what you could, the way you could answer his questions is, but Matt, based on your definition of knowledge, what I understand you to mean by knowledge, yeah, if God has this knowledge of our future choices, we are not free, full stop.
yeah, if, if there is some sort of truth value list like that that exists, fatalism is true. But that's yeah. not the type of knowledge that God has of human free decisions. That's not the type of knowledge you and I, you knew, you knew Jason was going to go home because you have knowledge of the future. I have knowledge of the future. It's not hard. Is it the case or not the case that in order for human free will to be free, God cannot know in advance what specific choices we'll make? True. Yes. No, I just told you, God can know the things we're going to do. God knew what my opening state was going to be. He knew what color shirt I was going to wear. God See, I wish I was here moderating you two because I could, I, I could explain this to Matt. Matt, in Chris Fisher's definition of knowledge, yes, but in your definite knowledge, no. Done. Or is it the opposite? depending on how you frame the question. God knows the future. Oh, he knows the future. Does he know the, yeah. the does he also know all of our free will choices? Why would he want to know that? It, not in the Bible. I didn't ask if he wanted to. I didn't ask if he wanted yeah. to. I said, yeah, see, Chris, you got to, in my opinion, you got to stop that. Because this, this happens to me when I talk to theists often. I'll ask a question and, and the theist will answer a completely different question that I didn't ask. And usually it's because they don't want to answer the question I'm asking. And this is how you're coming across, that you don't want to answer Matt's question. You would get a lot more credibility from the fence sitters if you just answered it directly. Does he also know all of our free will choices? Well, the writer of Genesis 6 didn't think so because he eventually regrets his own action in creating man. Okay, and so, so the answer is no? Making man. The, the biblical no. authors okay. don't think so, okay. so no. No, you, no, no, no. You're begging the question when you assume the biblical author means exactly what you mean. You haven't talked so you're the about one... Genesis 6. Yeah, I'm trying to understand what it is you believe. Look at it. I understand. Uh, I've written a great deal on open theism. I've talked to many open theists. I understand right. the position. So I'm trying no, to find out what your particular... I'm trying to find out what your particular view is. So let me define what free will is so that we can have a discussion around that because it's going to be important pretty soon. I'm going to show you the problems in open theism. Free will is the ability to make a choice that's consistent with your nature, that's not forced upon you. Self-generated, you can do it. Now, do you agree or do you not agree with that definition? That's an interesting definition. So Matt's definition of free will is all about coercion. I'm, how does this apply to salvation? On you, to make a choice, and pretty soon I'm going to show you the problems in open okay, theism. I want you to think, if you're a Christian listening, I want you to think about salvation as a Calvinist, a Calvinist view of salvation. Remember, the Calvinist believes that the Holy Spirit, God, regenerates the believer so they have the ability to change their nature and, and accept the good news of the gospel. Now listen to Matt's definition of free will. Free will is the ability to make a choice that's consistent with your nature, that's not forced upon you. So that's not forced upon you. Now, according to Matt's theology, we are born with a sinful nature with the inability to choose God. There's nothing good in us. We, we, we're drowning in the ocean. We can't even reach out for help. That's how depraved we are. So under Matt's definition of free will... Every person who becomes a Christian didn't do it freely. They were coerced by God to do it. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Calvinists, if there's any Calvinists in live stream chat, am I wrong? According to Matt's definition of free will, is doing what's in accordance with your nature without any outside influence, coercion. You're just doing what you want to do. What you're even programmed to do, one could say. But all of salvation, according to the Calvinists, is not that. It's God changing you, because you yourself can't change, to, in essence, force you to become a Christian. Self-generated, you can do it. Now, do you agree or do you not agree with that definition? That's really weird. God doesn't have access to the future choices of the people in Genesis 6. And so whatever definition of free will is consistent with that is fine by me. So do you agree with the definition of free will or not? Yeah, uh, if, if, if you're using it in the sense that the volition to do something originates from inside ourselves and is not external and it 
actually has to originate from our, inside ourselves. It can't be this uh, Richard Dawkins free will in which everything is based on priors. He thinks that people don't have free will. We're just tripped into free will. We all are doing something faded. There's an eternally faded future because everything is based on its antecedents. Yeah, which seems very reasonable what Richard Dawkins said, right, Chris? <laughs> like, how, how does something originate with it within oneself without any antecedents? That's what I want to know. Like, there's so many things that influence our choices, our decisions, where we're born, who our friends are, uh, what we ate for dinner. I mean, to say that there's this choice in us that originates with no antecedents, with no prior causes, I mean, that's a tough pill to swallow. It's like this choice comes out of purely nothing other than our volition, I guess. But the volition comes out of nothing. In this sense, I agree with Matt. Like, I have a lot more in common with the Calvinists than the non-Calvinists because I'm a determinist. Now, they say the ultimate cause is God. I say the ultimate cause is nature. And so, no, in that view, things are faded. But if people are the generators of their own ideas and choices, like I don't have the free will to fly, but that's just like a physical strain. If I could, I, I could think about things. If, if Jesus could say, not my will, but yours be done, we, we know that people have wills. Uh, Chris says that that's not what I said. Okay, what am I missing? So do you believe that people um, make free will choices in that with no antecedents? Or is it a, like a percentage? Like, uh, why are you a Christian, Chris? That cho Did you make a choice to become a Christian? And you can answer these when you come on, but something to think about for later. Why are you a Christian? Because you made a choice? Where did that choice come from? Why did you make that choice as opposed to not making that choice? Why did you choose to be an open theist as opposed to not... Uh, as opposed to being a Calvinist. And all those choices to become an open theist, well, it's because I read Scripture and I know what Scripture says. Well, why do you think you chose to, that interpretation of Scripture as opposed to Matt's? They get so complicated. He will? Yeah. He prayed okay. to God to probably forego the crucifixion multiple times. Yes, so Jesus had free will. Jesus also said he could do nothing of his own initiative, John 5.30, John 8.28. So he also, said, he also said uh, that he came down from heaven not to do his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him, John 6.38. Right. So yeah, here's a question. Here's a question. If Jesus had free will, how is it that he could only do what the will of the Father was? He's talking about what he's doing, not, not, not his capabilities. That's, that's begging the question. What does he mean in context of those phrases? So who's his audience, who he's talking to? What do they believe? And what is he communicating to them of substance? Yeah, it's, I think what Chris is saying is that just like any Christian desires to do the will of the Father, they sometimes fail. Right? And you can actually do the will of the Father in one area of your life, and not in other areas. <clears throat> Matt's trying to make it sound like it's an all or nothing type of thing. I asked, if Jesus had free will, how could he only do what the Father's will was? Right. A lot of people talk like that pretty normally within the Bible. And uh, it's, it's not this fatalistic concept. And so language doesn't work where there's these hard and fast rules where, where uh, like if you can only do something and not another thing, then you're fated. Uh, Chris makes a great State, uh, comment here. Free will would be functionally undisguisable from any level of randomness and choices. If the choice is not 100% certain, given all information, then free will does not exist. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, if free will is completely devoid of antecedent ca causes, then how is it distinguishable from random choice? I mean, just randomness, yeah. Like the people within the Bible are said to not be able to change. 
people are said to nothing that the person people want can be denied them. People are omnipotent, I guess, in your views, but language doesn't work like that. So you have to look at who's being talked to, what the specific point being made is, and is it rhetorical? Is it is a rhetorical flourish? Is it hyperbole? Is it idiomatic? What's happening in context? And it's not metaphysics. Within the Bible, a lot of people like to pretend the Bible is about metaphysics, but it's just not. I just read you like uh, 15 different verses which talk about mankind knowing all things. And so whatever you just quoted, 1 John 3.20 as God knowing all things, 1 John 2.20 is the same phrase used about man. So you need to actually go to these verses and show that they're talking anything about your metaphysics. They're just not. It's just normal language. Um, so, in, okay, I'm going to assume that uh, from what your open theism position is, I'm going to show you a huge problem from your position, uh, a huge problem. Uh, why I believe that your your position is seriously heretical. Well, this should be good. Among the uh, evidence that you're not able to understand who Christ is in the truth of uh, his hypostatic Matt, union you stop and that. communication of the properties. Um, Paul didn't believe in hypostatic <clears throat> union. He believed that the divine so, dwelt physically. The fullness yes, of God. Be, physical. Yes. Was, yeah, but you see, there's logical ramifications of this. Otherwise, you won't have an atoning sacrifice. So I can get into that. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, so I'm assuming from your position that God did not know every free will choice of every individual. So he did not know which individuals would actually be born and what sins they would commit in the future, right? Not yeah, exhaustively. We, we, had this, we, we had this discussion before, you and I. No, God did not know that, that the entire mankind was going to rebel in Genesis Chris, 6. Chris, just say right. And then he decided to wipe them so out. Much then he had another change of mind. All mankind could have been entirely gone forever. He had another change of mind okay. and saved alive one man and his family. So the biblical okay. authors did not think in these categories. So 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sin in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his stripes we are healed. So Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago. Did he bear your sins in his body on the cross? American soldiers died for my freedom in World War II. It, it, it's, it's not an argument. You're begging the question. See, language works like that where American... See, I would answer, yes, he died for my sins but not my specific sins. He died for my sins in general. So Chris is basically saying the same thing, but using an analogy. Yes, uh, soldiers died for my freedom, freedoms, but not specific freedoms. They didn't know that someday I would have the freedom to use a um, iPhone or something. And soldiers don't even have to know me, don't even have to know my freedom set, and they could still die for my, for my freedoms in World War II. And so you can't, yeah. you can't have an idiosyncratic way of interpreting language and then insist your metaphysics are being taught by that language. Yeah, but for Matt, uh, I'll just say this. Matt's a very needy, needy, needy individual. He needs Christianity. I mean, Matt will go insane if he leaves Christianity. I, I truly believe this. <laughs> Some people need it. Um, and so Matt needs to know. It gives him a huge amount of comfort that Jesus knew Matt's sins specifically, even before he committed them, and died for those specific sins. Jesus died for me, 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 and everything about me and my choices. And if you just make it generic, that just a blanket, well, he didn't really know what I was going to do, but he died for the blanket of sins I'm, uh, I possibly could do. That's not personal enough for Matt. Matt needs a, a personal relationship with Jesus that he knows everything. Sorry, I teared up there a little bit. I was, I, I, the, the Holy Spirit of Matt was in me there. Which you just can't do it. You need to show from the context why your interpretation of those sentences are the correct one. And you're not doing that. You're quoting half verses out of context. Go to the context, show why you think that the author's talking your metaphysics. They just aren't. So I quoted you the verse, he himself bore our sin in his body on the cross. Do you believe he bore our sin in his body on the cross? Right, and American soldiers died for my freedom. They sacrificed. Chris, you shouldn't said right. You should have just said yes, period. And then Matt's going to ask a follow-up question and say, not specific sins, just general sins done i'm trying to help you chris and you can disagree with me all you, what you want but i'm trying to help you be more efficient with your answers even at the risk of being misunderstood sacrifice their bodies for my freedom 
Do you believe that Jesus, Jesus, I'm asking about Jesus out of Scripture, do you believe that Jesus bore your sin in his body on the cross? Yes. What in context makes you think the author has your special atonement theories in mind? What in context? I'm just reading the text and just asking. Like, I think in general terms, Chris, the answer is yes, right? You do believe Jesus died for your sins, right? To say yes. But then when push, say, but I don't think Jesus died for the sin of me watching porn on the last Tuesday. You could just add to that. Well, maybe you don't want to say porn because then it makes you look bad, but. Question. Yeah, I'm going to say the text. God regrets his own action in creating man. We've not looked at the text. The, the, the text I bring up first, we're avoiding that for some reason. And we're talking about your atonement theories. Your atonement theories have nothing to do with open theism. There's like 50 different yes, atonement theories. And yeah, there's about 50 different atonement theories. And uh, yours is not like very pop. There's different ways to read this verse than your atonement theory. It, it has nothing so, to do with open theism. It's all special pleas. Yes, it does. And I'll show you why it does. You see, the Bible says Jesus bore our sin in his body in the cross. Open theism has a humongous problem because if God can't know what specific individuals will exist or what specific sins they'll commit, then how is it possible for him to impute our sins to Christ on the cross? That's my question. Can you answer? In a general way, instead of specific, Matt, that's how. Just like I think Chris gave a great analogy in the same way. Uh, U.S. soldiers uh, died for our freedoms without knowing specific freedoms. Jesus died for our sins without knowing the specific sins we'd commit. Done. For that? Yeah, American soldiers died for my freedom. They didn't have to know that I was going to yeah. exist. They didn't have to know what freedoms. That's just how normal language works. There's nothing in that verse mm -hmm. that... Uh, I'm not sure why Matt doesn't get that. And I think the, the reason why... Maybe he doesn't get it is because it's not personal enough for him. He needs, which is ironic because the, the God of open theism is actually more personal than the God of Calvinism, in my opinion. Yet Matt desires this more personal, Jesus died for this sin on this date. It's sort of ironic, isn't it? That Matt is screaming for this very personal God that actually he could get better through open theism. Instead of this nebulous, all-powerful thing. Chris, if you ever talk to Matt Slick about this again, that's where you should go with this. Because the reason I've talked to Matt Slick years and years ago, I actually have, I recorded it, but I think he asked me not to share it publicly. Or no, I chose not to share it publicly. But I know the real reason why Matt Slick is a Christian, and I think he said this publicly. And it's because his child died in his arms and he felt God in that moment. This is why he's a Christian. And so he actually desires this very, very personal God in his life. So, Chris, my advice is tap into that with Matt. If you actually have any desire in you to, have, to convert Matt to an open theist, saying, look, the God you believe in is not this personal, lovey-dovey God that you think he is. It's the God of open theism that will meet you where you're at, who will cry with you, who will help you day by day. It's an appeal to emotion, granted, but it works. Just my two cents. It means your atonement theory is true. You, there's no contextual analysis. You're just reading the verse, and then you're assuming it means whatever atonement theory you have. Yeah, your atomic theory is not in the verse. They didn't think like this. They didn't have that thought process. They didn't think that there was some sort of metaphysical list of sins in the ethers. Within the Bible, God decides to forget our sins and remember them no more. Within the Bible, God clears people's sins through burning coals, Isaiah's lips. They don't have your metaphysics in mind. What does it mean that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross? Well, probably something similar to the American soldiers uh, died for. Yeah, Matt thinks this is a knockdown argument, but it really isn't. I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. For you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his, his wounds 
you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Great. There's the context. In verse 24, he bore our right. sins and in his so, body on the cross. So I'm asking you, about which soldier is the one who does that? And you ask me, right. like John, direct the hypostatic union, because Jesus said such things as, I am thirsty, appealing to his, divine, his human nature. I'll be with you always, Matthew 20, 18, uh, uh, divine, uh, dealing with his divine nature. The one person of Christ claimed the attributes of both natures. This is called the hypostatic union and the communication of the properties, where the attributes of both natures. Is the phrase hypostatic union found in the Bible? <laughs> natures are ascribed to the single person this is right out of scripture i can teach on it for hours i've been doing it for it years and years i know the topic you, you just now, read evidence against what you claimed you said that jesus so, was god bodily you denied that you you deny, you, you think you, you don't, you, listen, in your listen, own words the listen, divine cannot has, be physical that's a look, platonist metaphysics the semantic mindset you, is that there's okay. overlap in the divine <laughs> and physical. chris what you should ask matt slick next time is could our sins be atoned for without jesus having a body physical body there's not a chasm. Okay. We don't. You couldn't argue your way out of a wet platonic bag. Look, <laughs> I'm going to tell you something here. Categories deal with the ontos. The human nature is different than the divine nature. You're making up. You don't have the properties of one communicated to the other. It doesn't work that way. They're communicated to the person. The divine nature is separate from the human nature. They are separate ontologically. They're separate by nature and essence with properties. So the attributes of both are ascribed to the one person of Christ. This is basic Christian theology, which apparently right. In you do not know about. I said so, that you here's would the talk in almost here's exclusively the Platonistic terms in your doing You so. don't even you understand what Platonism is. is. You don't even not, know what that is. If there, were, if there was a Muslim here, he would ask Matt, so God can die? The Bible doesn't talk like this. The so Bible God, yes, it talk. does. I, I, I give you the focus. scriptures. <laughs> You guys, let's focus on the topic, open theism in the Bible. All right, go with your question. Wow. So, yeah, okay. what does it mean when it says he bore our sins in his body on the cross? Still on this. Well, theology is called um, a federal headship. In Adam all die, in Christ all should be made alive. First Corinthians 15, 22, and Romans 5, 18. Uh, through so the sacrifice, you uh, through believe one. in universal salvation? Can I finish, please? Ooh, good question. Oh, go ahead. No, I don't believe in universal salvation. People go to... Oh! Snap! Listen. Listen to what Matt says. In Adam all die. In Christ all should be made alive. First Corinthians... In Adam all die, separated from God. In Christ all should be made alive. Rejoined to Christ. Chris asks a great question. Are you a universalist? The plain reading of the text makes it sound like all... We'll go to heaven, be re reunited with God. All will be made alive through Christ. But it's obviously not true, right? So just because the Bible says something doesn't mean it means it. <laughs> it's 15.22 in Romans 5.18. Uh, so the sacrifice, you uh, through believe what? in universal salvation? Can I finish, please? Oh, go ahead. No, I don't believe in universal salvation. People go to hell in Mark 3.29, Matthew 25, 46, uh, Romans, uh, I can get into other verses. And so if you understand what God is saying with the word all, if you go to Romans 5.18, through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. So also through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. The second all can only be a limited group. And that's exactly how God uses it. And I give you a Bible study on that. But what's really important is Romans 5. The second all is a limited group. 19 in this context where it says through the transgression of the one the many died the many died is what's called the aorist passive indicative in the greek which means that they died in adam specifically because of adam's sin that their sin, his sin was imputed and reckoned to those individuals so the all with adam is everybody but the all with christ is only some people the minority, actually, because why it's the road to destruction narrows the gate to life. But yet, isn't it in the same paragraph? The same sentence? Like, this is not very symmetrical. This is why I think Christians, you can understand as an atheist or for former Christians, we, we, we view all this as complete insanity and nuts and crazy. That you actually have to rationalize so much to make this fit did, you did elijah that? die did you affirm that did uh, elijah you die? don't even know what the, uh do you know what it means to die 
in this context. Oh, this is good. Well, okay, means, show me in context where it's defined. I don't want to hear all philosophizing about what you think it means. Death deals with separation from God in Genesis 2.17. God said to, to yeah. Adam, the day that you eat of the fruit, you will die. And he died That's physically right. later. Yeah, because he, God changed his mind. Once they explained why they did what they did, he didn't kill them in the day. The same phrase okay. is used about the dream okay. of Abimelech, the dying you shall die. Same phrase okay, is used. So, it's about physical Okay, death. so did God, God prophesy? Them. Did, did God prophesy that Adam would die that day? No, he said he that you would, it, you will die. Is it a prophecy? Yeah, a prophecy. 40 days in Nineveh is going to be overthrown. It didn't happen. Okay. Because that's what? There okay. are circumstances that change okay. different things. Different punishments are mitigated by circumstances. Okay. So from your... See, and all this is just, again, crazy to me because the death in Genesis was not a physical death that day. Surely you will not die that day physically, but you died spiritually that day, Matt would say. That rhymes. So death is a spiritual death. So through Adam, Adam's death came sin into the world. But yet Jesus didn't die spiritually he died physically or did he or both but definitely the, the physical part had to be in there your perspective god made a false prophecy what does the bible say about your false prophets your perspective jonah no, said no, 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 i don't believe they a false prophecy be overthrown. no i don't believe that didn't happen. You, you already know about didn't this happen. jeremiah 18 8. come on you know about this stuff look did god make a false prophecy when he said to adam that the, the day that no. you eat you're gonna die did he make a false no. prophecy he listened to oh, the circumstances so he did die and then he used he did die no no he didn't die? That's not how which is work. it no one talks like this non-central fallacy everyone drink drink non-central fallacy no one talks like that he didn't make a mistake so Remember, when god I said to kids, adam God said to Adam, the day that you eat of it, you yeah. will die. Yes. Did he die the day he ate? No, there were extenuating okay. circumstances. So then, so then God, like did God the prophesy? Bible, God says, okay. So God made a false prophecy from your perspective? Wrong. Wrong. Explain. Uh, how okay. I, I really want to understand this from Chris because I think Matt's making a good point. Now, Chris, the only way I think out of this uh, is to say... Um, God did not make a false prophecy because when God said, this day you will die, he meant spiritually, not physically. I think that's the way out of this. And I think this is the way most Christians get out of this. Let's see what Chris says. How is not a false prophecy? Right. The, remember the question that I continually ask you. I never get an answer. Jeremiah 18. There's, there's, God gives a parable of potter and a clay. He's building a vessel. It's marred in his hand. God doesn't get to complete what he originally set out to complete. And so the interpretation is this of this pro prophecy, this parable, is that when nations turn from their ways, God will not only do. Yes, about Adam. Yes, about Adam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Shh, shh. God will not only do what he thought he oh, was going to do, first, but he's not going to do what he said he was going to do. So God thinks he's going to do one th thing. In Jeremiah 18, it says, I won't do what I thought I was going to do, and okay. he won't do what he said he was going to do based on changing circumstances. It's not a lie. It's not a mistake. It's just the normal way people... But what's the changing circumstance here? It was an if-then statement. If Adam does X, you will die. The, on that day, you will die. In fact, a lot of people say that... Uh, the serpent was Satan or Satanist ish and tempted and, and lied. But Satan was basically just saying what God said. Operate. No one would describe that as a lie or mistake, except for a pundit, an internet pundit who gets his money from people who pay them him to say things that nobody else believes. No one believes these things. Non central fallacy. All right. So you go back to, come to in, Chris? Genesis two seventeen. Focus on the verse because God says that you will eat of not it, you do will what die. he thought he was going to do. Yes. Did God prophesy, predict the future? When you eat no, this, you will punishment. die. No. He if, didn't. If, okay. if you shed man's right. blood, by man your blood will be shed. Is that a prophecy? Yes. Oh, so all all murderers are they're killed by other men? No, it's a generic prophecy that things like this will happen. So we're it's talking. A, it's not specific, Oh, a generic prophecy that things like this will happen. That's a good point by Chris. The Bible says, if you shed blood, your blood will be shed. It's a generic prophecy. I mean, 
In general, yeah, but maybe some murderers get, get away with it. Specifically about Adam. From. I'm asking you about Adam. O.J. Simpson, he's still alive. Okay. Why is O.J. alive you about... if this prophecy is true? Why is this I'm prophecy? Asking... Uh, Chris, do you believe Adam actually existed in history? You about... I'm asking you about I'm Adam. I'm asking about O.J. Yeah, I know. And you said generic murderers, plural. Adam is singular. I'm asking you about Adam, so you're not on topic. Can you answer the right. question? Did God, did God make a mistake? In the garden. Okay, made a mistake. No, these are your words. Non-central fallacy. Everyone drink. Okay, look. Did God make a mistake? I've thinking, said no like 15 times. Are you listening to the things I say, or you just care about Yes, I am. Mind? They're not making any sense. You have... Well, yeah, it's because you're not a normal person. Your brain doesn't work like normal people. <laughs> normal people would not call that a mistake. If I'm bringing my kids to McDonald's, I say, everyone in the car, I'm bringing you to McDonald's, people. and on, yes, on the way there, my kids start misbehaving, and I turn the car <laughs> around, no one's going to say that I was mistaken about bringing them to McDonald's. Wow. It's just okay. when contingencies... Well, in a sense, you're mistaken. You should have predicted that your kids would have been unruly in that... So you maybe shouldn't have gone to McDonald's in the first place. <laughs> change, then plans change. God talks about this in Jeremiah 18. God won't do what he thought he was going to do based on circumstances. Wow. So I'm not normal, huh? Thank you. That's good. Yeah, but prophecy, I think what Matt's trying to get here is God needs to know the future and for certain prophecies to come true. And this is a problem within open theism, that if God prophesies X will happen and it can easily be changed by circumstance, then does he really prophesy? I mean, isn't he just kind of throwing out guesses into the future? Okay, I'm going to uh, open it up for Chris if he wants to come in. Uh, <laughs> Chris says, not my kids. My kids, I predict, will be uh, good kids. Yeah. Okay, so Chris, the way you get in here is I'll get a link. I'm not sh exactly sure what we're talk about because so much has been said already we'll let the holy spirit lead chris there's the link please only chris call in or matt uh if matt's here he can come in Oh, well, that'd be so much fun if Matt and Chris were to come in at the same time. I, as the benevolent atheist who's full of compassion and love, can bring these two Christians together to deeply love each other as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Open theism does not assert that God doesn't know the future. It asserts that the future is open and not predetermined. Yeah, it depends on your, on your definition of knowledge, Berserk. Like Matt Slick's definition, definition of knowledge is um, infallibly no. But if your definition of knowledge is predict, then you can say... Open theism does not assert that God doesn't predict the future. It asserts that the future is open. Oh, yeah, Marlon can come in, too, if he happens to be listening right now. I want to ask Marlon why he took it off his channel. Because to me, you know, there was friction here, but it wasn't that bad. By the way, um, when I do live streams, I decide maybe an hour ahead of time. I tagged Chris, I tagged Matt, but um, I forgot to tag Marlon. Here comes Chris. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do camera. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Why did so I don't uh, have too much time, but I do have a few minutes. Okay, why, why do you think Marlon took it off his channel? I think, he had an, I think he had an amazing amount of internal pressure from his own ideological camp. I don't think he would have done it if uh, 
he wasn't pressured into it. I think the Calvinists felt like they got. Oh, I got. I got. I got to turn off. Uh, real quick. But uh, I don't think he would have done it unless he had all that internal pressure. You think other Calvinists said, "Hey, Marlon, you, uh, Matt looked bad, and so take it off." No, I think they came up with any excuse to intellectually justify that. And so they were digging for anything. They were looking at after shows. They were just putting up any old reason. Like one of the reasons Marlon posted was that I came in with bad intent. Whereas if you go watch the Did God Have a Body between Anthony Rogers and Sean Griffin, Anthony Rogers in the debate says he came there with bad intent. It's it's not like a consistent standard. And it's it's more of like a post hoc justification. Okay. Um, I'm. Uh, there's probably a lot of people here who are still still not clear on what open theism is. So um, I'm going to say stuff, and you can either say yes or no, that I got it right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, just make sure we understand. There's a lot of different variants of open theism. So I could be answering for uh, open theism proper, or or what do you want? Okay, uh, I guess the the core stuff that most open theists agree on. So, uh, number one, God is not omniscient. He can predict the they future. They would never but say he, that. He can predict the future, but he doesn't know it infallibly. Uh, no, uh, most open theists would say that God's omniscience works where he knows future all future contingencies, and so since future. Truth propositions don't have truth values, but they're indeterminate. He knows them in their indeterminate state. And so it's a type of fluid omniscience. I'm not saying this is my position. Okay, what's your position? Well, if I'm a biblicist, there's things that God doesn't expect in the Bible that do materialize. And there's thought processes and patterns in which individuals convince God to do things for arguments that they they proffer, like in Exodus 32. Moses lays down a cascading list of arguments which God considers and then changes his mind. And then the future authors of the Bible, looking back at that, say that God changed his mind for those exact reasons. Okay, so if I say that God, if he exists knows the exact day and hour of my death. Would you say that's true? Would I say that's true? Yeah. Uh, God could know that in what sense? Um, I don't think the future exists. Um, I'm a presentist, and so there it doesn't exist in a way where God's knowledge aligns with existing truth values. It could exist in the Jewish compatibilistic sense in which God brings things to uh, f uh, f fruition, fulfillment, like God can prophesy that a murderer is going to die on a certain day and then get events to happen such that it occurs. That's the Jewish compatibilistic idea. It's not a fatalistic idea, but it is where certain things are conspiring to make other things happen. But the future doesn't exist in, in a way that you could... Time, time travel is not real. The past doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. There's no future existing propositions. Yeah, see, I think that's the core difference between an open theist and a non-open theist. A guy like Matt Slick would say, of course, Doug, God knows the exact day and hour of your death, whereas you would say no, unless God forced it to happen. Yeah, I don't think that that... I think that the philosophical construct of uh, a fixed timeline like that, it's it's Platonistic and it, it's not our intuitive sense of how reality works and so it has a huge barrier to overcome okay so that's the one main difference the second main difference between open theism and let's say i'll just call it regular christianity is um uh we that's omniscience uh, omnipot uh omnipresence because matt was asking you about that and i thought you were a little bit cagey with your answer but i'll just ask you directly do you believe god's everywhere well uh, you know biblical says no that they didn't believe that okay they, uh, no one in church history, except for lay people, have ever believed that God occupies every square inch. Again, the, the, the natural classical definition of omnipresence is that God is not contained within space-time. Okay. So if... So that's a layman position. So God, for, so God doesn't automatically know 
what's happening in the outback in Australia right now. He would have to make a choice to know it. Yeah, so within the Bible, you do see God having limited location and knowledge. The Sodom and Gomorrah is the most obvious example of this in which the information comes to God. In the ancient Near East setting, setting and you probably know this, um, there's, there is a divine court, divine council in which God sits, and then he sends out messengers around the world who see and watch um, the song or Proverbs say that the eyes of the Lord are on the ways of the wicked. The eyes of the Lord are God's messengers. They're his spy network. They report back to him. He makes decisions. We see this decision process in 1 Kings 22 when he queries the angels on how to get King Ahab to go out to war. You see it in, in um, Job 1 in which the adversary, who's an agent of God, reports back to God on his doings. And then, uh, then they they discuss from there whether or not he's doing his job, and and his job is to test human beings, and he's asking God to test a certain individual. So it's an ancient Near East concept that God rules from some sort of divine court. Okay, now, like you brought up the example, was it uh, Deuteronomy something about uh, God uh, leading the Israelites into the wilderness to test to see if yep. yeah eight uh, two yeah. Um, what's the difference between God predicting what how the Israelites would react versus God knowing? Like, do you think God really needed to test it, or would He say, "Well, I'm ninety five percent sure this is how they're going to act"? Well, here's the thing: you uh, what God does in the Bible is establish character patterns, and so you know what your wife is going to do, what she's going to say, how she's going to act by by being with her, around her, talking to her, interacting with her, getting to know her, and then you could fairly well predict their decisions. And so you, you see this... Well, my wife's, la my wife's last decision was to say, I do. So really, that doesn't apply to me. But Sorry, that's a bad joke. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, never mind. Um, okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, God can predict quite closely what how the israelites are going to react to his testing but uh, it's, it's knowledge that's gained from outside himself and so this is the key distinction so if you're familiar with classical omniscience this is knowledge that is ungenerated that means god did not get this knowledge from anywhere it never arose in god because it's always perfectly simple with him timelessly this is knowledge that's not dependent on the outside world so the world actualizes in the same way God's knowledge is, just independently and without any connection one to the other. This knowledge is non-discursive. That means you don't think one thought to another to generate thoughts. It's a, it's a divine, simple knowledge. It's inherent. That means it, it, it's necessarily part of God. And it's unfalsifiable. That means I can't know that I'm going to um, go to work tomorrow and then it not happen. It has to occur. So all these properties of classical omniscience, you got to keep in mind. It's not just this simple knowledge of the future that people try. That's that's what they want to debate because that's their Bailey and their Moat and Bailey. Retreat back to the Bailey and defend that. But their actual belief is this this Platonic type of knowledge that you don't see anywhere in the Bible. Okay, I'll I'll be honest with you. I view the Yahweh in the Old Testament like Thor, except maybe better. Uh, better at everything uh, knowledge predicting power strength but still it's a Thor char type character um, do you disagree with that characterization of, of God like that he's very personal yeah, he, like Thor but he, he's not he doesn't have these omni properties so um, you got to consider that in the ancient Near East worldview the Egyptian deities for example in Exodus they actually existed. And so part of the plagues punished the foreign gods as well. And you see the Ascension Psalm, a Psalm uh, 82, I believe, in which God disposes the lesser rulers of the world and takes control back to himself. And so all these deities uh, existed in their mindset. Paul says what you sacrifice, you don't sacrifice to God, you sacrifice to demons. And if you look at the anti-Christians in the first few centuries, they say, Hey, your demons are just the same thing as our pantheon. You sound like Heiser right now. Um, yeah. Do you believe that many gods exist? Yeah. Would you call yourself a polytheist then? 
Uh, no, there's 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 a term for where you believe in a monarchical type of god. Uh, if you, uh, yeah, if you, was it henotheist or something? Henotheist, something like that. Yeah. And so it's it's the same thing anyone else believes. There's angels and demons and lesser powers or hierarchical system. But like, do you believe Baal actually existed as an entity? Very easily. There is, well, Baal's just a general title. And so sometimes Yahweh is called Baal. You just got to remember that. So there might be various different ba ba Baals. And um, you do see when God is... Um, well, the, the uh, what? Why am I blanking on this? But God does fight other deities within the Old Testament. Uh, the Great Wrath. I'm gonna just Google it real quick. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. I, I, there's very few Christians I've met who are willing to admit this, though. Um, because I do view almost the, the Old Testament almost like the um, the pantheon of Greek gods in literature. Um, like the Marvel Universe, that uh, Zeus would be Yahweh, and then you got Odin and Thor and uh, all these other gods all playing in the same um, play box. So the Moabites. And so in, in 2 Kings 3, um, God prophesies that Israel is going to take all of Moab. Right. This is Jewish scriptures. The Jews wrote this. They included it. But it is kind of embarrassing. That's that's one thing the Jews do is they include stories that will still be embarrassing if they're they're told and they put them in their holy scriptures. And so the Moabites are prophesied to lose to Israel. They're going to cut down all the trees. They're going to stop up all the wills. They're going to destroy all the cities. They get all the way to the capital city, and then the king sacrifices his son on the wall. And then the text reads that there's a great wrath that comes across against Israel, and Israel retreats, and the prophecy fails. <coughs> yeah I, I like i don't as an atheist i don't believe there's any prophecies in the or true prophecies in the bible um there's claims of prophecy that uh i would say fail but from your point of view they don't fail just things have changed and so god adapts. well they you could so that that's a subjective categorization and so if people want to say that they fail that's their own prerogative Yeah, I guess. Um, but, you know, if if you can find a very specific prophecy in the Bible, I think it's pretty reasonable to say, and if it doesn't happen, it's reasonable to say, hey, that's a failed prophecy. Yeah, I got articles, the worst failed prophecy in the Bible, and that was uh, the coming of Jesus within the lifetimes of his hearers, the second coming. And so that was prophesied, that was known, everyone expected it, it just didn't happen. Yeah, how do you deal with that as a Christian? Well, if you're an open theist, then you go read uh, what uh, First or, or Peter three. Let me let me pull that up, where God talks about being long suffering, not willing that any should perish, and so He's willing to extend time frames. <clears throat> we see it throughout the Bible where the just the time frames don't work out, and so it's it's pretty common. And so if it, I think it'd be harder to deal with it if you're not an open theist and not willing to consider that things change. But if, but if I told you, Chris, that um, today at 9 p.m. this will happen, a certain thing will happen, and you, watch, you look at your watch, 9 p.m. happens, and it doesn't happen, wouldn't you just say to me, Doug, you made a false prediction? Oh, it depends. And so... Um, so if I say, hey, kids, um, we can watch TV, right? <clears throat> well, we'll watch TV tonight. And then something happens, and then we decide not to watch TV tonight. It's, it's not like it's a false prophecy. Just circumstances change. Okay, but if I were to say at 9 o'clock tonight, something's going to happen. <clears throat> Let's say uh, you're going to, uh, uh, I don't know, your, your front left tire on your, your car is going to... Uh, blow up whether you're driving it or not and um and nothing is going to stop this it's going to happen no matter what no there's no contingencies if that's the type of prediction then you would say i'm a false prophet i'm a false predictor right mm -hmm. yeah 
See, and I see, I see that happening in the New Testament when Jesus said, uh, is reported to have said, surely there are some standing here today who will not taste death. I mean, it, to me, that's... You'll see the coming before they go through the cities of Israel, yes. Yeah, to me, that, that that's like, no matter what, that tire's going to blow up at 9 o'clock tonight. It, to right, me, and I'm sure, like a ton of, I'm sure a ton of people deconverted after a lot of those things didn't happen. Yeah, for good reason, I think, because Jesus would have been a false prophet. Well, uh, unless circumstances change. So there's, there's things like uh, Nineveh, where it's 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. And then the, the people repent. It's a failed prophecy. It, it just doesn't occur. But there, people can look at the circumstances and they understand the reasons why it doesn't occur. So it's not a false prophecy. Okay. The, um, the, you talked to Matt about the um, Noah story. And what, how do you view the scripture that says God repented? Some translations say repented. Some said, uh, say what? Um, I forget what other word is used. Regretted. Are, are you able to play one of my shorts real quick? Yeah, I think I can. Okay. So if pull up my short about uh, repentance in Samuel. It's one minute long. Uh, God is not open is the name of your channel. Yeah, God is open. God is. Oh, sorry. God is open. Reality is not optional. And what's the name of the short? Uh, give me two seconds. It should, so it should or, be, or you can put uh, the link right in here in the chat. Ah, uh, I'm not in the chat. No, no, um, not the, not the it's, YouTube It's the one chat. with the girl on the cover. Um, not the smile one. <laughs> uh, give me two seconds. I'll grab it. Okay. It's uh. Because where I'm going with this question is. The whole point of this is if God would have predicted student, student shocked at Calvinist dishonesty. Student shocked at Calvinist dishonesty. Oh. When I was in college, open theism was the con. Yeah, you won't be able to hear it, uh, but uh, I'll play it here. Yeah, that's fine. It's the one with the like, it's. Oh, yeah, this is you. Like a professor. Yeah, professor. I'm not... okay. Boy, you put some good work into this. When I was in college, open theism was the controversy. As I watched, I learned a valuable lesson. Just because the person is an academic does not mean that they are objective or even fair to scripture. One scholar stood up and stated, God does not repent. Scripture says so. See 1 Samuel 15, 29. A well-respected scholar responded, in 1 Samuel 15, there are three statements. God says, I repent. Samuel says, God does not repent. The narrator says, the Lord repented. Hermeneutics 101. Who is to be trusted most? God, the narrator, or a character? And then he pointed out that God does not change his mind is in reference to Saul. The presenter hemmed and hawed. The entire room knew that the Old Testament scholar was right. And there I sat an innocent theology student, shocked and stunned. Just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you are virtuous or rational. When I was in college, open Okay, so that was the clip. Yeah, so the thing is that statements are contextual. And so you have to look at who's what's being said to who, for what reason, and what's the scope. And so when Samuel is saying to Saul that God's not a man, that he should repent, it's concerning God's decision repentance on making Saul king. God's not going to repent of repenting of making Saul king. And that's misconstrued as some sort of um, ad hoc metaphysical lesson. Calvinists want want that, uh, that want Samuel to be stopped in the middle of an event to give an ad hoc metaphysical lesson that applies to everything no matter what, rather than contextually limited to what's happening, what's going on there. Well, I'm not even getting at um, uh, contradictions in the Bible. I'm getting at more, um, here you got a God who is a very good predictor of the future because any information about the present or past, he can access when he wants to, right? And so here we have a situation where God created humans, could have predicted that there would be a fall, 
could have predicted there would be so much evilness that he would have to wipe out the whole population other than uh, Noah's family. So I guess my question is, if he can predict those things, why not just create start creation with Noah's family? Uh, he didn't. Uh, and then he lowered his standard because he found out something about man. So um, you should have your listeners go listen to Christine Hayes' um, biblical lecture, Old Testament lectures, Yale University. They're all free online. And God creates a man, and then he starts learning about them instantly. He doesn't automatically know all about who man is and what man's capable, capable of. One of her statements is that he slowly learns about man, and his learning curve is steep. Okay, and yeah. So the, this is my point. But then that implies that God's not a very good predictor. His, if you say his learning curve is steep, which means it implies he that... He hasn't had interaction with man previously. Right. You, you don't know how to predict things unless you have some sort of history to predict it against. But he did ha have history of the fall of the angels, right? Allegedly. Um, that, that, there's different ways to read that. Because this, this was my main point, like if God created the angels and one of them named Lucifer f ultimately fell and became Satan, I think even Heiser believes this, um, then God would have precedent of saying, well, maybe if I create humans, the same thing will happen. Maybe, but that's not present in the Genesis story. You don't see Satan in Genesis. You don't see any this fallen angel type stuff in Genesis. Yeah, you're right. It comes later. What it was in Isaiah or something, but um, yeah. And s s for me, so I got like two more minutes. So um, yeah. Okay. Let's. Can you understand? Can you put yourself in in Matt Slick's shoes and understand why he believes what he believes? Yeah, I actually have an intellectual Turing test video, in which an intellectual Turing test is when you are so able to repeat and mimic and argue for a different side that people will confuse you with a true true believer of that side. And so I got a Turing test video in which I advocate Calvinism and against open theism. And so you go watch that to see how well I passed the intellectual Turing test. And tell me if you agree with me. My main thing, the reason why you and uh, Matt disagree on this, I think the fundamental reason is because Matt's more needy than you. He probably is. Uh, you have, I, I just put out a huge paper that I didn't write, but I've been converting it to audio on the cult mindset of Calvinism. You have to understand that Calvinist works in kind of this cult indoctrination system, which, which establishes all sorts of ways to view the world and interpret the world and works hierarchically. And so it's you're dealing not with you're dealing with people that are part of what they've been indoctrinated into. Yeah, and but the reason why I think some people are indoctrinated into certain beliefs versus like other people who don't is because of a core fundamental need. Like for a guy like Matt Slick, he needs certainty, he needs stability, he needs this idea of this sovereign God who can do almost anything that as, as long as it doesn't contradict his nature and anything less than that, he gets, he gets mental anguish. And so he needs Calvinism. He needs this version of Christianity to survive. So Matt Slick's not your normal Calvinist. Uh, he's a major narcissist. And so I think he's built his identity on this and, um, he needs to be right all the time. And I don't, I, it's, I don't think it's generally exportable, his needs to all Calvinists. Uh, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, he has very specific uh, life experiences, but I've noticed this even with, with guys like James White, um, Jeff Durbin, it's like, there's this fundamental need for certainty. And if, and if it's, if knowledge is not a binary on and off switch, they start to freak out a little bit. Yeah, that's true. And so um, you'd probably find my book very interesting. It doesn't start with the position that the Bible is true. It says uh, we need to see what's in the Bible. Then we decide whether or not what the Bible says is true. And so it's a case study in reading comprehension, critical thinking, 
language skills, understanding idiomatic speech. It's basically like a textual study that you would see maybe with the Enuma Elish, right? I'm sure you and I could sit down and read through it and we'd probably come to the exact same conclusions about what's going on in that text. And, and normal people should be able to do that with the Bible too, but people don't seem to be able to have that capacity within themselves because of all, all their societally loaded values. In, I know this is going to be tough, but in, and I know you have to leave, but in 60 seconds, can you tell me why you believe the Bible has anything to do with a deity, with God? Um, what do you mean by that? Like, I, I view the Bible as um, a very interesting book, uh, a, a great book in many aspects, but I believe it's totally man-made, has nothing to do with a God. Uh, I don't believe any gods exist, and yet the Bible exists as it exists. Do you believe that the Bible is has something to do with a, with God, and if so, why? Yeah, I think so. I think the Bible is fairly reliable when it comes to archaeology. Things like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah have been found. Things like Jericho have been found. And even if you're talking uh, scientifically. So when I was on... Uh, know the guy's name offhand it's it's it'll come to me but uh, I, I pointed out that you have things like carbon 14 and diamonds and we know it's not carbon capture we know it's not contamination from the environment and we know it's not lab contamination so that puts upper ages on those diamonds 50 to 100 thousand years we have a, we have dinosaur dna that is carbon dated because it's not fossil it is actual original biological material and this stuff won't last for whatever time frames that they claim. And so we have all sorts of evidence around the world for a global catastrophe that wiped out life within the last 12,000 or so years. And uh, I, th I think the evidence points towards the biblical account. Okay, I'll give you the last word. Thanks for hopping on. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. We'll have to talk through some more things at some point, maybe do a debate review. Uh, I'm uh, grateful for your perspective, but I'll catch you later. Thanks. Okay, see ya. That was an interesting answer to my question. Why do you believe the Bible has anything to do with God or a God? And he went, I think, uh, straight to the scientific type stuff. The evidence, the very tangible empirical type evidence. But it sounds to me like Chris, from his answer is a young earth creationist? Interesting. Or maybe at least the universe could be billions of years old, but he believes the earth is maybe six to 10,000 years old. And because he mentioned carbon dating with dinosaurs and carbon dating is only good for the 50,000 years max. It sounds like he believes in a global flood. My question with the global flood is where did all the water go? Did it just magically disappear? Where did it all come from? Did it just magically appear? And if it's in the, the belly of the earth, we should be able to see it today, all that water. Hmm. Interesting. Chris said 100,000 years and Kent Hovind says 10,000. Okay. By the way, the whole age of the earth thing doesn't bother me too much. Most people, <laughs> the age of the earth is irrelevant to their lives and to their jobs. That's why I have absolutely no problem with the Speaker of the House being a young Earth creationist. Because we know that people can um, believe crazy things in one area of their life and be brilliant in others. I'm sure there's brain surgeons who are uh, Scientolog Scientologists, right? I guess I'll open the room up for uh, Matt Slick or anybody else who wants to come in. 
I'll pin the link. But let me try to sum up. I think the God of open theism is just not a strong enough God for most Christians to believe in. They need something bigger, better than um, Mr. Incredible or Thor. Um, and that's why they can't stomach it. But I do think the plain reading of the text in the Old Testament points to open theism. So the room's open if anybody wants to call in. I'm willing to talk to more open theists, more Calvinists, more non-Calvinists. Yeah, when I was a Christian, I didn't know what open theism was. Oh, I forget to I forgot to uh Say the word trans for uh, Chad. Trans. There you go, to Chad. Can't go. Can't do a live stream without saying the word trans. There was actually something I really wanted to talk about today. Uh, it has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with education. But if I start that, it'll, this will be a, uh, a five-hour live stream. Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Hey, Doug. How's it going? Good. Have we talked before? Yeah, a couple a week and a half ago or something. Yeah, I remember you. Yeah, very good. Great, great uh, talk. I'm glad you could have him on, and I glad it's it's really interesting. Yeah, I, I uh, do. You know anything about open theism? Um, yeah, yeah, I know a little bit about open theism. Uh, what I used used to be Christian, no longer Christian. Used to be Calvinist. Wrestled with the issue myself. So yeah, really, I, I love the perspective now that you and I are both outside of the debate. Like, this is an interesting topic. It's got to be one way or the other if you're a Christian. But now that I'm not a Christian, it's like, it doesn't have to be one way or the other. Neither way is quite satisfying. Yeah, there's benefits and drawbacks to both uh, belief systems in my view. And, uh, and I really do think it depends on the personality types um of the believer yeah so um chris i like chris from i've never seen his videos or anything else before so i i liked his approach in some ways um but i think i you were hinting at it and maybe the uh the moderator was hinting at it too that they didn't address each other's points like neither side was willing to go see the other side no neither side was willing to say okay under your view a b and c are true but then this can't be true what do you think about that there wasn't a lot of give and take that way yeah i agree i i, I don't think they like each other at all yeah <laughs> well when you that's, call someone a shame a, when you call someone a liar uh i understand that's pretty tough where do you go from there yeah, and I just, I still think like a debate is best when the two people are collaborating to put together an interesting content, not so much when I'm going to present my points come hell or high water. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wish I could moderate, I think, I think I could moderate those two uh, well. Um, yeah, I would. I love to see you try, or at least maybe, 
maybe if there was any kind of a way to reset the relationship so that you can find some common ground because it's like there was so little common ground there that they were talking past each other like one example chris seemed way too skeptical of matt um to the point where the you know the the moderator comes in and tells him quit holding up the drink sign and i get it because that's like i get he's making a rhetorical point right like Yes, Matt's predictable. He's going to say these things so we can make a drinking game out of it. But also, that's kind of wrecking the the tone of the debate and making it less less interesting, more combative, more more like a who's going to win, who's going to come out on top, who's going to own who, you know. And I appreciate that you don't try to do that too much. Yeah, I saw a debate with Destiny and who was it? Someone else. And I don't think they could see this, but whoever was controlling the uh, debate, whenever one was using a fallacy or not addressing a question, uh, answering a question, it would pop up on the side. And so the moderator just let them do what they wanted to do, but the audience could immediately see, oh, okay, this per you didn't answer this question. This was a fallacy. Like every time Matt uh, Slick said, you know, I can uh, explain this to you in a private uh, Bible study or whatever, it's, you know, it's, it does, he doesn't need to say yeah. that. And Chris made, I think, a ton of mistakes by just not answering the question directly. Um, and I understand, right, that, out good and I understand that they are coming from such different worldviews that it, even s simple definitions that you think are simple or not, like like knowledge, for example. Well, that's never a simple definition, but um, yeah. So yeah, I'll also point out, like Chris says, I don't want to hear your philosophizing. But really, the whole thing is a philosophizing because we're trying to apply logic and reason, and we're trying to figure out uh, what is the right framework for understanding this thing we both think to be true. Yeah, and that takes philosophy, and. It's disingenuous to say, I get what he's saying, right? Chris is saying you're in a different philosophical mindset than the audience of the New Testament was or that the apostles were or whatever, that the Old Testament for that matter. Um, and that's a good point. But he didn't really make that point explicitly. He resorted to kind of these little glib uh, shortcuts to making that point, right? And maybe it takes a little more care and, and concern to do that. Well, and I also think that it goes v much deeper than that with Chris. Like Chris, I think, throws up in his mouth when he thinks about Greek philosophy when applied to the Bible. Like he's he has so much disdain for it um, that whenever Matt talks, like he it's almost visceral for him that he just hates it. Yeah, and that's part of the issue. And I saw that on both sides. Like Matt would get upset. Sure. Like there was, I wrote down one note. He Matt said, "You couldn't argue your way out of a wet platonic bag." Look, <laughs> let me tell you something here, and it's like, okay, you got upset, and as a result, it makes you come off as you're trying to bully. And obviously, Chris isn't going to be bullied. Well, and Matt Slick said at one point in the debate that he, open theism is her heretical, and he wants it to die. Yeah. Like it shows just how passionate he is, but which is ironic because he's a Calvinist. So, from before the creation, the foundations of the world, whoever's going to heaven, whoever's going to hell is already set, and we're just going to find out. And so, um, and what so these heresies, what what's the real issue? Like, sure, someone's a heretic, but is it actually going to change the number of people who go to heaven and hell? Ah. <laughs> well, I mean, Matt b built his website on exposing heretics right in part anyway his website is all about here's the right doctrine so yeah and i mean calvinists would say it's up to christians to be faithful to god and god will work through them in the way that he has predestined to do so and that doesn't remove the responsibility for christians to be faithful to god and stand up against heresy and whatever else they're supposed to do yeah true but in the big picture of things, it's not going to make a difference. <laughs> well, it is going to make a difference in that Christians say that God uses Christians to bring about his plan, and that makes a difference. 
but you're right in there there's that free will component like my free will isn't going to impact that even though my free will is a part of that or my will i should say if it's not free yeah god actualized every contingency and every heresy which will be thwarted and every heresy that won't and it's all just going to yeah. run its course and then we all die and god sorts it out and i always appreciated my calvinist pastor when he said look it's not up to us to figure out what god wants it's up to us to do what god says to be faithful and god will figure out what he wants in that context and so that made more sense to me than us either being fatalistic calvinists who don't care about anything versus open theism which says well god doesn't even know except he knows all these other details about it that make him a really good predictor and make him a really good at at uh being sovereign over the universe and and yeah and, and i guess i'm with you now like both of these are kind of ridiculous <laughs> yeah well anyhow i'll let you go and uh keep the room open for anybody else who wants to call in i'm not going to go okay, too much thank longer. you appreciate it okay see ya catholic tutor Hi, Catholic Tutor. Greetings. Uh, your voice sounds familiar. Have we talked before? Yes, we have. Ah, okay. You told me I'm not a real Catholic because I think that the Bible has contradictions. and I'm, I can't be sure about the resurrection, so you said I'm not really a Catholic. Oh, and you're bitter about that. No, I'm not bitter. <laughs> I've heard worse. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, the, the topic was on Max Lick? The topic was on open theism versus uh, not open theism, I guess. Oh, yeah. I just... You know Max Lick's daughter is an atheist? Yeah, I think I knew that. Public atheist. So, like, I think the reason he has so many personality problems is because he knows that his master has not chosen... Ha rather, has chosen his daughter for help. And he has to live with that. God does not want her in heaven. She's not dead yet, so we don't know that. Oh, well. There's, what are the Matt's, Matt's probably thinking that all things work out for good for those who follow and love Christ. And so uh, someday his daughter is going to find Christ, maybe on her deathbed. Yeah, yeah. That's my, what he, my wife thinks about me. <laughs> That's what they keep telling themselves. Yeah. And if she dies in a car crash, it'll probably be like, no, nah, she accepted Christ in secret right before. And nobody knew. Yeah. Anything to make you sleep better at night. You believe right. in all that, though, right? Like, you believe that if you don't accept Christ, you go to hell and the hell's a bad, bad place? Um, yeah. It's it's Catholic doctrine, but... Yeah, like, you got, you got to believe what said, the... You got to believe what your... Uh, your uh, people tell you to believe, right? Yeah, but even the Pope said, um, I believe hell is empty because God's love overcomes all things. I like The, the I, Pope I is a that. universalist? Not, not officially. He said, I can't prove it. He said, I, I, it's not doctrine. I just, in my opinion, I think that hell is empty. I think that God's love is just too great. Wishful so, thinking on God's part. Yeah, but the Pope said it, so I can just run behind that. You don't, you don't really believe the Pope is any different than you and me, right? What do you mean? Like, it's, does the Pope have some special powers? He has a special anointing, a special authority. But he can that be, he can be uh, as wrong as you and me, though, right? Not when he on on um, on most topics, yeah. But not on faith. But not on faith and morals. So you do believe the Pope wears like uh, special uh, superpower underwear? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a mature way to put it. That's a funny way to put it. No, it's funny. It's funny. I, um, I I personally think it's very dangerous to say that any one man um knows special things that about the Creator of the universe than other people. 
but, but every Christian thinks that. Every Christian has their pastor, and their pastor is a sole authority on what they believe. I never and, thought and so, that when I was a Christian. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. I, I was a bad Christian, I guess, because I questioned my pastors. I disagreed with my pastors. I took notes and showed them from week to week where they contradicted themselves. I mean, I, I was a real troublemaker. Okay, so you thought you were the Pope of your own life. You thought that you were the just interpreter of faith and morals. I was just asking right? questions. Just asking <laughs> questions. Hmm. It sounds like you were your own Pope. So I don't see the difference, honestly. Well, no, I admit I could be wrong. I, I, I admitted that uh, I don't have the special anointing. When were you ever? When did you ever say you were wrong? Like as a Christian, correcting yourself. As a Christian. Uh, on like on the um, eschatology stuff, I was very agnostic. But you're asking when? You're asking me to provide an example of a theology that I admitted I was wrong about. Yeah. When did you ever self-correct? Like say, oh, okay, baptism. You know I'm wrong about this. Yeah, when I was 18, okay. I thought sprinkling was good enough, but I, I was actually dunked because I thought the more biblical way to be baptized was full immersion. So I changed on that. Yeah. Okay. I guess you considered yourself fallible, even though 99% of your positions were absolute and directly from the divine throne room. Um uh, I don't, I don't really see the difference between that and um, what the Pope does. Um, well, come on. You don't see a difference between the Pope and me? I don't. N not, not to most people. I was a Protestant for years. Oh, and he's gone. I mean, people worship the Pope almost. I don't, where's my worship? Where's my bulletproof car? I tell you, Catholics, I, I do view Catholics more crazy than Protestants. I really do. And it's because of this, this idea of this infallible Pope and church authority. And, and you guys like you guys like things too much, like altars and and pictures of Jesus and stuff. I mean, it just to me, it's it's more superstitious than the Protestants. But I was raised Protestant, so there's my bias. Okay, let's wrap this up. Uh, do I use the same song I opened up with? You guys ready to hear the best song in the world? Ever? Can you handle it? 